Okay, so um, uh, perhaps we'll start. Um, Ajinda, can you share the can you share the slides, please? Okay, so uh, perhaps I'll just carry on. Um, uh, we don't want to eat into the speaker's time afterwards. That's a more interesting bit while I do the introduction. Um, hi. hi, those of you who just come in. Um, I'm Danny Yong. I'm from uh, Kini Academy. I'm the CEO of Kini, Kini Academy. And, um, oh, oh, there it is. Yes, uh, let me give a quick uh, introduction on Kini Academy. Um, uh, Kini Academy is the training arm of Malaysia Kini. Uh, we started some three years ago. We are very involved with uh, up, uh, upgrading and upskilling journalists. Yeah, uh, so we, we cover all sorts of uh, courses uh, in uh, training of journalists, including new um, upskilling course that, that's like uh, in digital skills. And uh, we also were very much into investigative journalism. And, um, and now we also have some projects on our ASEAN collaborations. So we have one that is active currently with uh, PCIJ of uh, Philippines and Tempo of Indonesia, where we are working on a project to uh, cover the uh, COVID-19 uh, financing by governments in the region, right? So obviously this is another one of the uh, ASEAN collaborations. So um, this particular project is uh, the sponsor for this is uh, IWPR or Institute of War and Peace Reporting. They are a network of organizations that's headquarters in London, headquartered in London. And uh, the, the, the office we deal with is uh, the office in Manila, as well as uh, Washington, DC. So IWPR sets out to support reporters, citizen journalists, and civil society. Right? So uh, we thank them very much for uh, their kind sponsorship of this uh, project. So what we're trying to do with uh, this project is uh, to uh, connect journalists um, uh, and, uh, oh, too fast. So we, we, the idea is to connect journalists and uh, in two main areas. I can't control it anymore. Can you go back one uh, agenda? Uh, no. I don't know why. Uh, so um, the idea is for journalists like yourselves to connect with each other and uh, collaborate more. And uh, we, what we try to do here is to connect you guys in two factors, with two factors. One, um, all the journalists invited here are from, uh, reporting from the same desk, which is uh, current affairs and politics and that sort of thing. And secondly, we are connecting you based on uh, common topics of interest, which is ASEAN related. Yeah? So the idea is uh, this, this is one of those uh, projects to help maybe start off the networking. Uh, so therefore, when you are in the chat group, we encourage you to have your name and your publication in, uh, in your profile name as your profile name, so that you know, uh, people know who you are. Uh, we also encourage journalists to join a little uh, WhatsApp group that we have already set up from the first masterclass. So that is the idea is to, uh, to, to have that at hand in the future when you write a story that you want to reach across the border to get a comment to, to share notes with a colleague from the other country, uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be easier. Uh, additionally, when you see all these uh, expert speakers that we have, um, we will also uh, let you have a uh, 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 access to them, like for today, you'd be asking them plenty of questions. They then can be your source going into the future, right? So what C4 is, there's three, there are three components to, the, to C4. Uh, one is the masterclass series. Obviously the masterclass series is what you're attending right now. We have three more coming up. Uh, that's in uh, another one in September and two more in, uh, in October. Uh, and uh, a we're working on, of course, reporting projects. So uh, all reporters here are actively working on stories. 
So we have um, Alia, who is uh, probably working on uh, the uh, last week's topic, which is uh, labor migration, you know, and uh, Alia and probably you know, uh, 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 Annabelle working on, uh, on uh, today's topic. So, and we also have a forum that will be coming up soon on the c4.org. Um, and the idea for that is to get more people to join the forum to discuss things discuss uh, all the different sort of um, uh, topics that, that are of interest to all of us, okay? Uh, these are the five masterclass series. So please note the dates uh, for the next three. Uh, the next one is two Saturdays from now, and then the following one, two Saturdays from then, and then two Saturdays from that. So 25th September, 9th October, and 23rd October. Uh, the one on 25th will be really interesting. Uh, of course, we we are more or less... Um, past the Phuket sandbox situation now, uh, even Malaysia is uh, talking about the Langkawi land box to, to pave the way for the reopening of uh, the tourism sector for the rest of the country. Um, and uh, 9th October is on maritime security. I know some of you know a lot about it. Some of you don't know as much. Um, uh, part of the aim of the masterclass is to uh, help, help you guys uh, get up to speed with some of these uh, topics of interest. So uh, we package it in such a way that uh, you'll get already input from uh, the story from all these expert speakers. So that's a, that's a quite easy way to uh, get up to speed on this topic. And the final one, final one is a big topic, which is uh, turning the tide on corruption. So uh, all, of these, uh, all of these are really interesting. And, um, and uh, what we do is we try to get, uh, we get the best minds from ASEAN to speak about this. I will let uh, uh, SL to uh, introduce the rest of the speakers, but uh, it's uh, Wong Siu Lin, uh, Surin Suk Suan, uh, obviously uh, he's Thai, and Larry Maramis from Philippines and uh, Helena, Dr. Helena Waki. So um, uh, Singaporean. So we have uh, these four esteemed speakers with us today. I hope, I hope, I hope you guys will um, take the opportunity to ask many questions uh, as you would as, uh, as reporters. So the idea is uh, they are here, um, uh, ask the questions you want to ask, especially if you already have uh, an angle in mind so that you, know, you can fill up all the blanks that you, all the gaps and information that you have uh, through those questions. All right. And uh, sorry, Helen, uh, <laughs> Dr. Helena is, Vagi is Malaysian also. So sorry, uh, some housekeeping rules. Uh, we try to keep your mics on, on mute, please. Yeah, and uh, uh, do leave your video on so that the speakers, uh, you know, uh, they will encourage the speakers to uh, to uh, to be more in, to to engage everybody as well. Um, do put your questions in the chat box if you have them. Um, uh, our our team will put that together and uh, <laughs> and uh, present that to the speakers. Speakers will take questions. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, Siulin will be managing the managing the, the sessions, and uh, she will she will welcome questions, and she'll probably take questions uh, uh, at the end of each speaker's session, maybe even before. Uh, we'll leave it to her. Uh, the idea is to keep the conversation going. Uh, I think you guys know already the session is being recorded, and the recording can uh, we we will send the recording out one or two days after. All right, and we will also. Uh, get the transcripts done and uh, have that available on the website for those of you who want it. Yeah, I know some of you um, uh, will, will love to have the transcript to have that, um, uh, you know, translated and you can use it in your, in your home country. Okay. Uh, so let me go quickly to the poll results. Um, quite a few of you uh, put together, came, came in and kindly fill up the, the, the poll. So it seems like... Um, the first one, the first question, as a journalist, how often do you cover the environment and climate change? It seems like 70% uh, of you do. So this uh, should be quite interesting for you guys. And how familiar are you guys with the ASEAN governance mechanism on haze? Uh, we do have, uh, Larry is gonna help you, help shine some light on this. Uh, so this will be, uh, his session will be especially interesting for you. If you wanna plug that gap, in, uh, in the information. Is haze linked to climate change? Most of you think that's the case. Um, let's see what the speakers have to say. Right. 
the list the top three main drivers of deforestation in Southeast Asia. And, uh, you know, overwhelmingly everybody says palm oil and uh, infrastructure development. So I guess it's no big, um, no big mystery to everybody. In your view, to what extent does politics influence the haze crisis in Southeast Asia? So we looks like the respondents are all leaning towards the right side, where it's more more influenced than not, right? Uh, I wonder if the speakers will comment on all of this. I hope they would. See you, Lynn. Uh, so let me get straight to uh, the event at hand. Uh, Wong Siu Lin, she's the co-founder and editor of the environmental journalism portal Makaranga. She's a she's KL based researcher and writer, and uh, in uh, almost thirty years, she's covered and consulted on environmental and sustainability topics, and she's done that in print, broadcasts, and online media, and for a host of clients. Uh, she's also a recipient of the Rainforest Journalism Fund, a grant for environmental reporting connected to the Pulitzer Center. So, uh, Siulin, take it away. Thanks very much, Danny. Hi, everyone. Uh, really, really happy to be here. Very uh, humbled to be with, uh, well, with all of you, uh, but especially my peers, my uh, fellow journalists from around the region. Uh, we've got Indonesia, we've got um, uh, Malaysia, of course, we've got, uh, I think, Singapore-based publication. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, more from the rest of the region will join us as, as we go along. Maybe some people are a little bit late. So I know most of you from your publications, of course, uh, and some of you from your bylines. Uh, I know that some of you have already covered the haze, others have covered palm oil, others have covered deforestation. So um, from different aspects to different levels of depth, yeah? As, as we can see, about 30% of those who had answered the poll have not covered any kind of environmental issue before. So I'm going to try and uh, address, I think we're all going to try and address all the different uh, levels uh, sort of things. So, um, so what I'm going to do is to set the context for today's session yeah? um, and then hand you over to the real experts, those with really, really deep knowledge. Um, and these three experts have that. Uh, it's very rare to get this breadth of subject matter panelists together specifically to speak to you guys, especially to journalists. So I hope as, you, as we go along, as Danny said, please ask a lot of questions. I'll put them in the chat group and uh, uh, in, in the chat, and then we'll try and get to them at the end of every presentation. And the rest of it, we'll try and scoop up. And um, you know, the, the Kini Academy team are going to uh, put them together at the end. And then hopefully, we'll have a good discussion going. If there's not too many of you, and I actually haven't checked with the team about this, but um, maybe you could put on your mics and we could have a, a, a proper discussion. Yeah. So let's, let's see how it goes. Yeah. OK, so for my presentation, um, uh, I have drawn mostly from regional publications here. Yeah? And the credits are there if you want to read the stories by your fellow ASEAN and international publications. Uh, no copyright infringement is intended. These are for presentation purposes only. Yeah. So let me carry on now. OK, so, so let me begin with the context uh, of transboundary haze. Uh, this is an issue of air pollution. Um, it's an environmental issue. Yeah. Uh, just to bring you right back to basics, yeah? Air pollution, what is it? Basically, it's the presence of substances in the atmosphere that are harmful to the health of humans and other living beings. Uh, they can cause damage to climate. They can cause damage to materials. There are many different types of air pollutions, air pollutants, such as gases, particulates, biological molecules, right? So haze is one type of air pollution. Uh, haze consists of small particles, so with this famous PM, 2.5, yeah, smaller than that, very, very tiny particles that make up enough smoke, dust, moisture, and vapor suspended in the air to impair visibility. So that's what haze is. Uh, so you can see a pic uh, picture of Vietnam, right? Now, when we talk about transboundary pollution, now haze pollution can be said to be transboundary if it is so dense and so extensive at the source where it is produced that it remains at levels that can be measured after it crosses um, a country's boundary through the air, right? So uh, the definition of transboundary pollution is pollution that originates in one country, but is able to cause damage in another country's environment, okay? By crossing boundaries through water or air, 
that's transboundary uh, pollution, right? Pollution can be transported across incredible distances from hundreds and even thousands of kilometers. They don't recognize any kind of national boundary at all, right? Now, uh, haze isn't the only type of transboundary pollution. So I just present the context here. In fact, big environmental pollution problems are very often transboundary. So we have here, of course, plastic pollution. Uh, Southeast Asia's plastic pollution is polluting the world. Uh, there was a report that five countries, uh, four of which are from uh, Southeast Asia, are responsible for 60% of plastic residue in the ocean. Okay, and the impacts are many. They impact biodiversity, uh, the economy, human health. Plus, plastic is also transported through the air. Another type of transboundary pollution is oil spills. Uh, this is a picture from Malaysia, uh, and it's along the coast of the Straits of Malacca, which is like the busiest shipping lane in the world. So loads and loads of ships go through. We don't know where they're registered necessarily. So when an oil spill like this happens, this uh, quoted about two kilometers of the coast uh, on the west coast of uh, Peninsula Malaysia. Um, uh, I don't think that there was any actually findings out of this, right? They use drones and everything, and they try to figure out where did it come from. So the impact also is huge. Biodiversity, obviously, but it's also economic. Fishers, tourism, human health, right? Um, so, and then the last type of big transboundary pollution is, of course, POPs, persistent organic pollutants. Usually this refers to um, pesticides, right? So large-scale agriculture, and we're going to be talking a lot about large-scale agriculture. Um, that, that's where uh, enough of these pesticides are used. And then through the air again, they get transmitted across boundaries. And why are they so harmful? It takes a very long time for them to break down. Um, and they affect biodiversity again, especially pollinators, talking about bees, insects that pollinate, and obviously human health. So, so that brings us to transboundary haze again. Now, one nature of transboundary haze is that it's seasonal. In ASEAN, yeah? it's seasonal. So for media, why report it when it's not happening? Out of sight, out of mind. So there's one group that thinks that this is newsworthy, and this is the United Nations. Uh, in effect, they've decided it's so important, it's got to be highlighted more. So. In 2019, the UN uh, had a new designated day. You know, the UN has all these different days for this, for that, and the other. It's got one of the prettiest names, I think. It's called the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. And it, was, it just passed. It was the 7th of September, right? Um, and uh, this is a picture from the Philippines with blue sky. I think we'd all rather be there enjoying the blue sky rather than here in front of a computer uh, on a nice Saturday afternoon. Uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's basically to bring attention to the fact that um, air pollution is a very, very serious problem. So this year is only the second time that they've sort of observed it. And the hashtag is healthy air, healthy planet, for obvious reasons. Uh, we're in the midst of, uh, we're in the grip of um, COVID, yeah? So health is very, very important. Um, and that's one of the two things that they have decided need attention this year. Now, according to the UN, air pollution is the single greatest environmental risk to human health. I'll repeat that, the single greatest environmental risk to human health. It is also one of the most avoidable causes of death and disease globally. So when I saw this figure, like how much of our world is actually exposed to polluted air, I was really struck. I thought maybe 50%, maybe 60%. According to the UN, it's 92% of our world is exposed to polluted air. And obviously it's not exposed in the same, to the same degree. And I'm gonna keep coming back to that. The fact that there is impact, the impact is actually unequal in our world, right? So uh, the second thing that they want to highlight for this year's uh, theme is impact on climate. So these little, little air pollutants, right? They call them short-lived climate pollutants, right? They are the, the pollutants most linked to um, what they call near-term immediate warming of the planet. So now we know all about CO2, climate change, CO2, climate change, CO2. But these little, little things actually make up like 45% of um, uh, greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming, okay? Um, and they remain in the atmosphere for a much shorter time than carbon dioxide. And yet the potential to warm the atmosphere may be many, many times greater, okay? So um, it's great to see that in the poll, the majority of people 
know and realize that the haze and air pollution are linked to the climate. And Surin actually is going to uh, touch on that. So he's the speaker after me, yeah? So moving on, uh, let's look at the impact. So I mentioned a few of the impacts just now. What are the impacts of haze and air pollution? Obviously, it's not just environmental. It is very multifaceted. So what does it impact? It impacts human health. It impacts biodiversity. It impacts the climate. And it impacts the economy and politics. Okay, so these are the multi, this is what makes it very interesting. An environmental problem actually has many, many different facets. And that makes it very interesting and perhaps very challenging to report on, okay? So now let's dive into the ASEAN transboundary haze. Now, in telling stories about transboundary haze, I just want to highlight two points, right? Maps, that's really one of the best ways one of the best ways to tell environmental stories as a whole, but certainly when it comes to the haze, okay? Uh, again, out of sight, out of mind, that's what I mentioned just now, uh, there's always an eye in the sky on that satellite. And the use of satellite imagery actually makes it very hard for anyone to say, look, it ain't happening, it's not coming from my country, it's not crossing boundaries or anything at all. And there's not just one satellite, there's multiple satellites, right? So uh, I'm going to call your attention to two, uh, so two, two sort of uh, sources for this kind of maps. One is the ASEAN Specialized uh, Meteorological Center, which I think Larry might be coming to. So he's gonna give you a fascinating sort of background and intro to the, the whole ASEAN setup for how this sort of ASEAN center came about, right? And what you're looking at here, so this came from ABC, uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and they've used a map from Global Forest Watch. And they also have very good um, sort of, Clicking too fast. Going back. A minute. Okay. So, uh, so this is the Global Forest Watch uh, map. Okay, and and basically they give you very very clear indications. You can see where the hotspots are. You can see uh, where the most severe ones are and the ones that are not so uh, severe. Now, in terms of the other point, I want to just highlight in, in doing environmental stories is please speak to the scientists, right? please get your science right. Because uh, you, know, you, you really need to do that in order to get your, 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 your facts really, really accurate before you go on to talk about other elements of uh, this very, very complex problem. So please talk to scientists, meteorologists, air pollution experts, public health experts, just get the science right. That's just really quite critical, right? So what we have here um, in ASEAN, there's basically roughly two, two areas. You can sort of divide the, the, the problem into two areas. We've got the southern countries, you can see here, uh, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Timor-Leste. You can see all the way up to here that this is where um, the haze issue is affecting. Now, it, uh, just several points very quickly, and again, I'm going to leave it to the experts to bring you through this. Um, that basically in the south, it kind of began, big, big events began in 1997. Um, now, in 2015, the haze also affected Philippines, and you can't see, it went up to Laos as well. That's how severe it was, yeah? Uh, and the costs are many. We've got millions of hectares of land burned, millions of hectares of forest. That includes millions of hectares of forest, uh, millions, billions of uh, dollars uh, being, you know, totaled up. Um, and then you've got carbon emissions as well, and the social costs, education, poverty, and so on and so forth, yeah? Okay, and uh, now we're going to move on to the southern. Trying to move on to the sorry to the northern part of ASEAN, right? Where there's also a uh, transboundary haze, and perhaps the people who live down in the south don't really realize what's happening up in the north, right? Um, and so what you have here, uh, again, use of maps from two different sources. On the left, you have actually got the Thai Space Agency map. Okay, you can see all the different hotspots here. Uh, and this is, this is from uh, a, a publication which focuses on, on the Mekong area. And on the right, we actually have a map from NASA. And between these two maps, you can see it's definitely hotspots and transboundary haze happening. Okay, so the northern countries would be Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand. Now, they, they, this, this kind of phenomenon started a bit later, in the mid-2000s. But it's gotten a lot worse in the last two years. 2019, the haze periods were longer and harsher. They also started earlier in the year, okay? And it blew over to the Philippines. 
So, so you know, the transboundaryness of, of, of this problem is, is huge, right? Uh, and it's got the same cost of land burned, forest burned, uh, in terms of money and so on and so forth, right? Okay, so I'm going to move on now very quickly to drivers. Now, um, I'll talk about current and upcoming drivers. Now, the next three speakers, again, are going to be, uh, uh, going to be doing a far better job than me in talking about this. Um, but you can see from this picture immediately, transboundary haze is caused by fire. Okay, now the poll results are very interesting because you've got 100% of people saying, yes, it's oil palm. The next highest is actually infrastructure. That's very interesting. And nobody said maize, which is actually uh, very, very key in the Northern Southeast Asian countries. That's a very key source of haze in the Northern South Southeast Asian countries, right? Now, uh, I'm just going to mention a couple of um, elements that are usually connected to these drivers. So in the south, in the southern countries, we've got El Nino, uh, Southern Oscillation. That's its full title. We always say El Nino. Just a reminder, it's natural. It's a natural climatic phenomenon which occurs in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Basic, basically, the surface uh, ocean gets warmer, the winds get weaker, and then that leads to very, very dry conditions, which result in fires that are set. Um, uh, becoming severe, okay? The opposite is La Nina, and that means more wet than usual kind of weather, okay? Uh, other elements that are co connected to the southern um, transboundary haze is the clearing of peatlands in Indonesia to plant oil palm and trees for pot and paper, all right? And yet another element I just want to point out is again, the transnational nature of this, Malaysian-owned companies, in Indonesia are some of the culprits, okay? Now, going to the north, some of the drivers in the north, right, is the burning of maize plantations primarily. It's not the only thing, but primarily maize plantations during the summer months um, for animal feed and for biofuels, right? So there's been an expansion of maize farms, huge maize farms in the Shan State, Northern Thailand and Laos. Um, it's related to poverty. Farmers are trapped in debt, okay? So it's different, different from the south or not, we'll, we'll hear from the experts. Uh, and again, the transnational uh, nature of this, the largest maize for animal feed invested in Myanmar is a Thai multinational, okay? So we have human actions, human decisions, and the consequences of that, Surin and Helena coming up are going to be covering that. We're going to see here very, very interesting points from them. They have studied this uh, in great detail and it, fantastic, uh, really looking forward, I'm looking forward to their presentations as well. Um, the other driver, they say, is the lack of an effective ASEAN regional approach. Again and again and again, we hear that every time there's a haze issue, we hear this. What's ASEAN doing? We need regional. We need regional to come in. So Larry is going to sort you out there. Um, but I want to also look at other drivers that are current or in the future. I want to look at climate change. Okay, we've got this 1.5 degree uh, thing happening. This is a very big year for, for climate change again, and as, as well as for biodiversity loss. Um, world's getting hotter. How is this impacting um, the transboundary haze? We've got COVID-19, okay? And um, the impact of uh, coming out of COVID-19, is there a Green New Deal? What is it? Is it ASEAN-wide? Is it going to work in this kind of situation? Just like to throw all these different ideas out there, okay? So, so those are the drivers. Uh, now we talk about stakeholders. We have a picture here of Singapore. You can see the merlion there, uh, but we've also got other elements here. We've got a child here. So the stakeholders, the people, obviously, people's health. Uh, I'm going to point out again, is there enough coverage of the most vulnerable of societies, children, the poor, indigenous communities? And then obviously this is Singapore. Nations are a stakeholder. So you've got Singapore, little island, <laughs> completely surrounded by actions that they can't control. Right, uh, so they came up with an act to try and do that, um, to prosecute companies and individuals, individuals as well that cause air pollution in Singapore, outside of Singapore. I don't think they've actually applied that at all. Okay, why? Okay, and again, talking about countries, and we're looking at ASEAN here, who are the most vulnerable countries? Who are the most poor of these countries? How is this actually affected them, affecting them? And is it going to continue to do so, right? And then you see a very big, all these big uh, uh, buildings here, uh, businesses, big, big businesses reel from the impact of uh, transboundary hands. So we have the financial, manufacturing, 
tourism, agribusiness, agribusiness especially, and we're going to come into that a lot. Okay, and of course, the final lot of stakeholders I want to mention are the natural world, wildlife, and forest. Okay, so let me come now to narratives. Okay, let's look at how media has been covering this. I'm going to focus on two publications uh, on the South, so bear with me, Malaysia, Kini, and Tempo. I'm not trying to create a war between the two publications, so bear with me. I'm just using these as examples, right? So what we have here is in 2019, uh, so we had hotspots. So this, this is the map that you're going to see over and over again. This is from the uh, ASEAN Meteorological um, uh, Center, which is very, very important. Everybody refers to, so you can see where the hotspots are and how they floated over into Malaysia, as well as uh, uh, the, the rest of the region as well, right? Timor-Leste is here as well. And then what happened in this uh, piece was they also covered, uh, you know, what happened locally. And basically, they were also pointing out hotspots within uh, Peninsula Malaysia because it's not all important. But then what happened? was in uh, Tempo, this is the Tempo piece. And what they did was to report of a meteorological department uh, leader who said, oh, no, 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 the, the haze actually isn't coming, for, uh, the haze in Malaysia isn't coming from Indonesia. Wow, okay, so what happens then? Then this is a Malaysia King article, and this is just a reflection of the whole Malaysian media. And they reacted immediately and said, no, no, see the map, see the map, that this is the, the haze really, really came from Indonesia. So it really has been affecting us, you know? And this goes on, it gets escalated. So then, you know, uh, Indonesia claims the haze in KL. So a minister comes in and says this in Indonesia. This is a Malaysia Kini report. And then you've got um, uh, a Tempo report saying, okay, uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia actually says, okay, Indonesia's in denial, right? So this is from one day to another day. And then the third day, boom, okay, oil palm companies. That is always the narrative that comes through. So blame the oil palm companies. And then the same narrative gets repeated over and over again, by which time everybody is like all this finger pointing, people are really fed up. And then Tempo comes up with a lovely article on a Spider-Man who tries to, save, to, to, tries to save the day. So what you have is a mythical hero who is actually amongst the people and trying to do something practically on the ground. Anyway, this is just to say, okay, how can we raise the narrative? Now, the news folks, you guys have to do your job. You guys have to do your job, but there are like news narratives, uh, news features that perhaps could you include something else? Could you include uh, that the political element rather than just referring to a geographical or a scientific point of view, right? Um, be careful of national biases. Uh, I'm as guilty as anybody else. The use of media by governments and by politicians. Is it an election year? Is the minister under some sort of pressure? Uh, is there mishandling of another environmental problem? Uh, is your company being supported by advertising from a big multinational? So these, these are all different things. And then is there opportunity for collaboration between media, which is one of the goals of this project really, right? So Helena is going to come back at the end by talking about narratives from a very specific point of view, right? So um, I'm just going to end very quickly here. I think my time is up. And that is going. Okay, so the narrative as per the title of this session is basically you have haze, transmogry haze, caused by, uh, which is linked to deforestation, which is linked to oil palm, okay? Is this the narrative? So I'm just gonna end here and put up the three next speakers to see how you could possibly broaden the narrative and raise the nature of the narrative, right? Um, and that's it from me. Thank you very much. So, uh, right, so lots of questions. Uh, okay, um, anybody got any questions? Uh, you just drop them in here. Uh, I'm going to get the, if the speakers, the other panelists could just unmute your microphones, please. Um, I think Helena, you had a question about environmental reporting that we were talking about before the session. Um, Helen? Okay, we appear to have lost her. Okay, uh, Surin, do you have uh, any intervention, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just an observation. I think it's very uh, relevant uh, to talk about narratives and perceptions because I think that there's a lot of signs, but, uh, you know, the signs can also be 
seen from different lenses, right? Uh, you can you can read a piece of fact, but then you can choose to interpret in different way. Right? So as you can see, uh, unfortunately, I think it's a tough job for journalists because if you go into too much detail, you go too much jargon, you're gonna lose your audience. And you know the audience would be the general public in Southeast Asia, right? So how do you balance it up between having too much detail, too much science, and then a risk of alienating your your audience? But at the same time, if you if you don't point out the facts, uh, present them in a systematic manner, um, you know the the truth could be could be even harder to to reach, right? Uh, and then in the midst of all of this, you have politics coming in and and interregional, you know, kind of conflicts, uh, some deep rooted cultural issues as well. You know, the kind of friendly rivalry between Malaysia and Singapore, uh, issues of cultural misappropriation between Indonesia and Malaysia, for example. So when you put it all in the mix, then you, you really do get a hazy kind of situation. So that's just an observation uh, on my side. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Surin. Yeah, he, he, Hazy was deliberate, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and I guess that's, that's, that's the thing. It's very, it's very challenging for, for journalists to, to try and uh, keep in mind all these different things. You know, so reporting got deadlines and you've got to get the news story out there. And, uh, you know, to try and keep all these different things in there uh, might be a little bit difficult. Uh, there is perception and, and what the media does actually is, as, as media pra practitioners, uh, we are responsible for shaping that perception. Um, so, so um, yeah, I'm just going to come to uh, one of the comments here. So uh, Deborah says one of the pictures from the last slide was from your comics illustrator, which is why I, I really love that, 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 that approach. So New Narrative came up with, uh, I think, a series of three articles on uh, the Hayes uh, in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And one of them was uh, just the approach was a very emotive one. It was a series of, of articles, uh, of um, illustrations, very poetic, actually, and trying to get to the emotion of the impact of the haze uh, on people, you know. Uh, so, so many, many different ways of storytelling for sure, yeah. Uh, and we have a question from Adib as well, who says, to what extent does terminology play a role in defining the narrative surrounding transboundary in Southeast Asia? Um, terminology as like saying that it is haze as opposed to Maybe I can, I can try. I think maybe Thanks, uh, I can give some context to this. Uh, perhaps, uh, Adib, if I understand you correctly, uh, the narrative uh, terminology about haze in particular. So one of the things that was really interesting that I, I kind of discovered digging back into, you know, where all this come, came from, uh, what were the words being used to describe the problem. Uh, so because, you know, ASEAN, um, even though the speaking language is uh, English, but um, there was actually no standard term for haze. So for example, in Malaysia, we call it jerebu. But if you go to Indonesia and you ask somebody, the jerebu tak this year, nobody will know what you're talking about because they call it asap. So there's no standard, uh, there's no standard term for haze. So actually, um, from what I gathered with, uh, with my research, uh, in the beginning, when ASEAN wanted to even address the problem, they had this issue. What should we call this problem, actually? And... Um, there were several terms that was floated around. So for example, like smog or fog and stuff like that. Uh, but there was, apparently it was a very um, deliberate choice to use haze because if you look in the dictionary, haze is actually a natural phenomenon. It's not a man-made one as opposed to smog, which we know like London smog, it's, it's very industrial. It comes from the factories. Um, so it seems like it's a very, it's a very man-made thing. So um, at the time, you know, all of this was very sensitive. We didn't want to point fingers. It's very much in the ASEAN way kind of thing. So the, the deliberate choice was made uh, to not use the word smog and um, instead use the word haze, which is a bit more um, open-ended in terms of who's at fault. So don't really put focus on the fault, but more put focus on the solution of the problem. So this is why we use haze uh, officially at ASEAN, and this has uh, become to what we know today. La, as haze is what we think of automatically, we don't use any other terms, uh, especially in English. Uh, but it, but it does, I think, um, play a part in how we understand and how we view the problem. Uh, and especially in the in the early years, there was 
quite a lot of difficulty to actually start even talking about what are the real drivers in, uh, for haze in ASEAN. And I think we've come a long way since then, uh, but in the beginning, definitely this was a, a big political issue, a sensitive issue to even yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. what actually caused the haze. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Helena. Yeah, very, very, very good contextualizing. And yes, does that answer your question, Adit? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So, so terminology is is something that's that's very tricky, and uh, we're going to hear lots of this uh, negotiations and stuff like that at ASEAN level from Larry afterwards. Who actually was was at some of the the formulations of uh, so he was at very seminal points of, of of trying to address this big issue. So it'll be very very interesting to hear from him. Um, uh, uh, definitely. Yeah. We have someone joining us from uh, Frontier, Myanmar. Hi. Uh, how are you? And. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think today's talk will be largely from focus on the South countries and, and on the issues in the South, you know, so uh, please feel free to share everybody who's from, from the Northern countries, and I really hate to have this North-South divide, but, you know, slight, similar but slightly different kind of um, uh, is issues there, you know, and, and please feel free to share, uh, you know, put in your mic at the end uh, to, to, to share any thoughts that you have uh, of what's happening out there and how journalists are trying to to cover uh, the issues over there. Yeah, um, Larry, I have a, I have a question for you um, now. In terms of media coverage of uh, the ASEAN's approach, and I know you're going to get into this, uh, you know, a little bit later. Have the narratives changed? You've been you've been like Helena studying this a long time, been in this formulating and all that kind of thing. Have narratives changed very much or, or are you reading and listening and watching on TV the same thing over and over again? Well, I think the narrative has changed. Uh, the public is generally more informed. There is science uh, involved in, in, in being infused in the discussion. And like uh, uh, I think um, it has been pointed out that uh, science can also be uh, like Surin, I believe, pointed out, so right, science could also be uh, used, uh, well, politicized as we, as we see. And so there is that, that issue. Um, so the level of discussion and narrative discourse, public discourse is relatively, um, relatively uh, sophisticated, I would say, because it's now uh, we are talking about an informed uh, public. But there are issues uh, where the narrative de degenerates into very Political rhetoric and and uh, and uh, as you already pointed out, uh, Julian, is also timed very much, you know, uh, suspiciously with the uh, with elections. So there are these issues that one has to uh, be careful of. I mean, uh, from our side and the researcher side, uh, uh, the media certainly uh, needs to be uh, aware uh, that um, you know, as as the political temperature rises, uh, the rhetoric uh, also uh, does the same. So I think that. That is, but generally, to get to your point, uh, the language, the terminology, the vocabulary, the standardization of terminology is now there. I think, as uh, Helena pointed out very well, uh, um, there were issues in the beginning about using the word haze. There's no problem with that now, and uh, people understand that. You know, people also connect with one word uh, um, issues uh, rather than make it too no, nuanced and too complicated. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Larry. Yeah, we, we certainly look forward to, to hearing from, from you a little bit more. Um, uh, Surin, I'd like to come back to you as well. Uh, now, you, you work both in, in Malaysia and Indonesia uh, currently, uh, although you've worked in, in, in many other countries as well. Uh, is, is there a particular, you know, you mentioned also like uh, cultural differences between two, the two countries. Do you see that uh, still playing, being, being at play right now in terms of uh, media coverage of it? Do you see this happening amongst other countries uh, who are trying to deal with the transboundary haze? Well, I think haze, like many other issues, uh, have a tendency to, um, you know, kind of emphasize uh, any kind of intercultural issues or historical kind of conflicts, you know. Uh, on the one hand, it can be quite uh, lighthearted, but on the other hand, it can get quite serious as well, depending on the on the situation, right? So, I don't think that these kind of issues can can 
can disappear completely. I mean, even when we are talking about food, for example, right, then people start saying that you know something is their heritage, and then you you see another culture or country reacting to that, saying no, hang on, that's ours as well. And so I think when you have a, a, a kind of a very controversial issue like Hayes, where there is a lot of finger pointing, I think those issues will will come up again. So I, I don't really see how people can get away from that. But in the, in the, in the context of um, regional cooperation, then hopefully um, at least at the kind of governance level, people would set aside those kind of uh, different, because you know, those kind of conflicts tend to be at a more personal level, you know? uh, and, but usually when you have diplomats talking to each other, I mean, that they wouldn't usually uh, have that in their way and probably Larry can confirm that. Right? So I think when it comes to regional co uh, cooperation, then people would just focus on the problem and see how, how they can solve that. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely hear more, more about that from Larry and how, how easy it is to focus on the issue and not have regional differences and cultural differences and, and all the rest of it uh, sort of get in the way, yeah? Okay, so, so, um, so shall we go on to you now, uh, Surin? So uh, let me just do a very quick introduction of you. You can read uh, his, his, his CV, uh, basically on the, on the literature that's been given out. Uh, Surin is Southeast Asia Regional Director of a consultancy firm based in KL in Kuala Lumpur. He's got more than 20 years of experience in natural resource management and biodiversity conservation. Uh, he's a real expert in protected areas, uh, forest landscape management as well, yeah? Uh, he, he has worked for an NGO, he has worked for, uh, 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 you know, for, for, for uh, uh, a consultancy as well, yeah, and so he's got, uh, he's experienced many, many different ways of, of working and, and coming at problems, uh, the real problem solver this. Uh, so basically, uh, Surin, I'd like you to, to take away, I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, um, a, a presentation from him and hopefully followed up by a, a very, very good uh, discussion following from this. Yeah? Surin, please take it away. Thank you, uh, Surin, and hi, everyone. Um, you know, happy to be here and uh, engaging with all of you. And, and yes, I am hoping that we will have a very interesting uh, session uh, we'll, which will take uh, course over most of this afternoon. Uh, anyway, the, the topic that was uh, given to me was talk about uh, the nexus between the environment and the economy, uh, how you know, palm oil and sustainability and, and haze are interconnected. And there are a few missing pieces in between as well, which uh, I will discuss. Um, and also, you know, to challenge some of the current uh, perceptions that, that some people might, ha might have in terms of the cause and effect of, of, of haze, uh, what has, uh, you know, what is the role of the private sector and the, the companies, and also I think something that is not so uh, much talked about, which is the solutions part, and, and not just, uh, I, I'm not touching on the um, intergovernmental type of solutions, which I think Larry would cover more in detail, but more, more about the private sector response, because that I think is often overlooked. And it's, just, it's interesting to know that, uh, you know, especially in recent times, some of the big corporations in the world have, uh, you know, GDPs that are bigger than some of the small countries in the world, right? So the role of the private sector uh, cannot be uh, overlooked. So yeah, um, I believe I'm, have control now of the slide. Yeah, I do. Okay. So, as a brief outline of my presentation, I will talk about uh, some, you know, what are the key drivers of deforestation, both in, in the Southeast Asia context and also globally, just to, you know, understand the differences. Um, and uh, yeah, I know that some of you have responded to the poll. So, let's see whether, you know, you're on the mark or, or you know, there are other things that you might have missed. Um, and I will also try to link up between deforestation case, climate change, uh, peatlands as well, right? So how they connect with each other. And then I'll zoom in a little bit more on palm oil because palm oil is the topic that people seem to kind of immediately uh, come to mind, you know, have in their mind when, when it comes to haze. I'm not sure why, but maybe we can try to see what could be uh, the reasons for that. 
some some of it valid, some maybe not so valid. And then we'll talk about how um, crop production uh, in particular, and, and I'll use the, the, the example of palm oil because there's a lot that has been done uh, with regard to palm oil sustainability, but you know, much of it is also applicable to other crops, yeah? Okay, so just looking at it from a global point of view, uh, what are the key drivers of uh, deforestation and uh, this this uh, data is from the FAO. Unfortunately, we don't have very up-to-date data because there is always a lag time uh, in terms of coming up with the analysis, right? Because uh, you have to look at the trends over a number of years and then you have to spend quite a bit of time analyzing and then you get a paper published and all that, right? So even though this paper uh, was published, I think around 2011 or so, uh, but the data was up to 2008 and, and maybe FAO might have come up with a more um, recent analysis. But you can see that uh, while the, uh, you know, the, the values might have changed, but if you look at the, the overall trend, even from 1990 uh, and uh, to, to, to the year 2000, you compare that with 2000, 2008, the trend hasn't changed that much in terms of what are the, the key drivers, right? Um, so it's interesting to note, for example, that there's a lot of um, unexplained deforestation. I think, you know, people don't know what the key drivers are. So maybe uh, the area is burned and then it's left idle for a long time. People, people don't really know what has happened to it. So uh, sometimes it's, it's not really uh, obvious what is the purpose of the, the deforestation? Because the way that they, they track deforestation is to see uh, uh, after the area has been cleared, what gets planted on it. So the assumption is that whatever gets planted on it was the, the reason why the area was cleared uh, in the first place, okay? So, but the, I mean, between uh, 1990, 2000 period to 2000 and 2008, at least more information uh, was, uh, I think the, the detection of deforestation improved, also the monitoring have uh, improved and, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, the, the number of unexplained events has decreased, right, between those two time periods, you can see that. But in terms of the major drivers, you can see that the key ones are still there, uh, no major change with regard to crop production. So, so the, the expansion of agriculture is still the leading cause of deforestation globally followed by, as you can see, the dark blue here, livestock production, actually. So, you know, so you have crops and then your livestock. Actually, both are basically different categories of agriculture, right? So you can say that if you combine these two, you know, clearly uh, agriculture by far is the main uh, cause of deforestation. And then after that, you have natural hazards like wildfires. So fires can actually um, occur um, uh, sporadically or, or um, you know, uh, on its own, right? Uh, it, because of increased heat and so on, right? So you can combust uh, uh, naturally as well. Uh, and then you have uh, some other uh, minor causes, uh, logging, uh, industrial roundwood here, and then also infrastructure. So that's, that's the global picture. And then if you look at uh, the, the, the regional, um, uh, scenario, and I'm going to focus mainly on Southeast Asia because that's, you know, that's where we are and that's what uh, this session is all about, right? So I've put these two big arrows there just so that it's easier to focus on, on the uh, specific section of the chart that you should be looking at. So if you look at uh, the two time periods again, 2002 to, to 2008 and 1990 2000 and year 2000, uh, you can see that actually in Southeast Asia, there has been uh, some changes in terms of the key drivers. Uh, again, as with the global scenario, the number of um, uh, deforestation events that uh, are unexplained have dropped between the two time, uh, two time periods. So in 2008, you can see that unexplained uh, deforestation is now not a, a, a major proportion of uh, total deforestation, as you can see in uh, 1990 and 2000. Uh, the main driver is crops. Yeah, and again, uh, that's not much change from the earlier time period. And then, but the, there's a big change in natural hazards. So in, in 1990 to 2000, you see that, that there's a lot of 
uh, deforestation that was um, attributed to natural hazards, but then the absorb dropped uh, significantly. And then the rest uh, remain more or less the same. You have livestock, industrial round wood or industrial logging, um, and then infrastructure development. And uh, if you just, if you imagine, uh, just, just taking the portion that says crops here, yeah, like crops and livestock, yeah, these two categories, and you zoom in further into that. And here we have uh, slightly more uh, recent data. This is from uh, a report that came out in 2016, but I think the source data is still covering 1990 to 2008. Actually, the main cause of uh, the, uh, the 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 yeah the main driver of deforestation in the agricultural sector is livestock, right? So it's it's interesting, right? And this is where you talk about perception as well, right? There's a lot of NGOs, uh, consumers campaigning against the use of palm oil, for example, because they say that palm oil is, is a major cause of uh, deforestation. But you don't really hear people saying, okay, you got to stop eating beef for or McDonald's or whatever, because it's causing de deforestation, right? So, but, but if you look at the facts, it actually says that beef, especially uh, uh, cattle farming is a major cause of, of uh, deforestation. Yeah, by far, you can see the, the, the chart here. And, and then the other kinds of livestock, pig and poultry, because they tend to be more intensive, right? People, people have pig pens, they have uh, uh, chicken coops, you know, they have, you know, Sound like uh, um, like a factory, even like right? the way chickens are being treated these days. You don't really have uh, free ranging chickens uh, being uh, being bred in a, in a large scale. But with beef, with with cattle, sorry, you you still need all that uh, space for them to roam. So that, especially in Brazil, as you can imagine, you know, huge areas are being cleared, uh, being being burned, and so on in order to make space for, for uh, cattle farming. So that is the key driver of uh, deforestation worldwide. And then uh, other crops, soy, maize, as, as uh, Zulim has mentioned, and then palm oil. So as you can see from a global ranking point of view, where crops are concerned, palm oil is actually ranked number four. Uh, not to say that it's totally uh, blame-free, yeah, still a significant amount of of uh, deforestation is due to palm oil uh, expansion, oil palm expansion. But uh, I, you know, it seems like they're getting uh, the palm oil people, the palm oil industry are, are getting a disproportionate amount of the bad press as compared to livestock, for example. Yeah. And uh, more specific to to uh, Southeast Asia, uh, we have two key elements of of um, uh, climate change, actually, uh, or GHG emissions. Um, so I mentioned, I've been talking a lot about deforestation on the charts that I shared with you earlier was about deforestation. But the other big thing really is peat degradation because not all forests are equal. So most forests around the world are not on peatland, right? They're on mineral soils. And when you and so so what you what you are uh, concerned about is the the the, the whatever that's above ground. Right, the trees, the leaves, the branches, whatever you know, whatever that's above ground, a little bit in the root as well. So when you have deforestation, all that plant material is is going to decompose and turn into carbon dioxide, methane, all the all the greenhouse gases. So, so yeah, that's why deforestation is one of the the main uh, uh, causes of um, uh, GHG emission, leading climate change. But when you have forest on peak then the, the, the problem is like double or triple because a lot of the carbon is actually stored underground when you have peat soil. So peat soil basically is made up of unde uh, undecomposed uh, organic material. It's kind of like a huge carbon store uh, within the soil. And then when you start draining the peat and, 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 and you know, start planting on it, that, that organic material is, it will start to uh, decompose and it causes a huge amount of GHG emissions. So I have put this simple event chart here just to show that you have deforestation, you have peat degradation, then you have this overlap in the middle where you have forest on peat, but you also have a lot of peat that is not forested anymore. Maybe the forest is created a long time ago, but as long as the peat soil 
remains with all that organic material there, it will continue to emit GHG gases. Um, uh, and in, in Southeast Asia, we have particularly deep pit that can go up to say even three, four or five meters deep. So that, that's why it's a huge issue. And uh, this is just a simple diagram showing how peat is uh, formed. You can, you can find out more about this yourself, but essentially you have a waterlogged area, you have uh, plants, uh, trees growing, and then as time goes by, the, the trees, uh, uh, you know, they, they topple over, the organic material falls into the waterlogged area, and then you have for soil starting to, to form over time, and this could be over hundreds or thousands of years, eventually, you have the peat soil developing is kind of a, in a dome shape and then and then you have a forest growing uh, over it as well and um, yeah uh, that that's basically how you, you have uh, all this organic material accumulated in the soil and that basically is is combustible and uh, a major cause of um, uh, fire uh, and haze uh, during the dry season yeah, so basically this is the kind of progression in terms of uh, how peatlands end up from being in a natural situation. They get drained out because you know, peat in its normal uh, form is usually wet and is waterlogged. But in order to cultivate on peatlands, they will construct canals and drain water out. And then you end up with dried peat. The organic material is exposed to the sun. Uh, it, it starts to decompose and then becomes combustible. Uh, so two things happen, you have pit fire and then the gases are released to the atmosphere, but the soil itself as it gets burned also subsides and sinks down. And then actually it becomes flood prone as well during the, the, the wet season. So the end effect you'll have GHG emissions and flooding, GHG emission fires during dry season, flooding during wet season. So it's, it's a huge problem on many uh, dimensions. Right, so that's just a pictorial kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a present presentation of of what I was saying just now in terms from natural peatlands, deforestation, clearing, drainage, peat fire, and and then sometimes being planted with plantations. And one reason why you get a lot of all palm planted on peat is because they do tolerate. Uh, high, relatively high water table. Not all plants are able to, to uh, survive in peatlands, but um, all, palms, uh, all palm uh, plantings are actually quite well adapted to that. And that's why you have huge areas of peat planted with all palms. Uh, this is a pretty neat uh, GIF that I got uh, uh, from, from an Indonesian uh, 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 site. I think it's, it's, it might have been BRG actually, which is a Indonesian agency, but as you can see, uh, it's, it's got this graphic that shows how uh, fires can actually persist uh, underground in the peatland because of the organic material, and then it might then come up to the surface. So that's why uh, peatlands are notoriously difficult to manage, uh, difficult to put out fires that are occurring in peatland because these fires here can can rage on for weeks. Uh, while on the top, you might not see the fire, and then eventually they find an outlet, and then they, the fire will uh, break out again. So this is a huge problem. Um, interestingly, um, due to efforts by um, the, the Indonesian government, uh, you can see that the deforestation rates have dropped uh, between 2011 and 2020. Uh, and again, there's, there's, a, there's an issue of perception and, and um, you know, biasness as well. From the Indonesian point of view, the, the government said that, well, it's mainly due to our action because we have a peat moratorium, we have an oil palm moratorium, we set up the uh, peat restoration agency, we've done a lot of things, we've worked with NGOs, blah, blah, and therefore we have managed to bring down the deforestation rate in Indonesia, and that is measurable, right? Because you have satellite uh, imagery that can back it up, all kinds of uh, data, right? But then you still have campaigning NGOs saying that, oh, no, 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 it's not really so much uh, due to the effort of the Indonesian government, but it's more to do with um, NGO 
pressure, for example, it's got to do with COVID because there's less activity during COVID. That's why the rates have dropped. So, you know, you, you see this kind of debate uh, going on as well. So that's another uh, kind of dimension to this uh, narrative. And then the other dimension, of course, is uh, it's about oil palm, right? Because uh, oil palm is, is the number one um, cause of, of, of deforestation and, and fires and haze, as, as far as most people are concerned. And even the poll that we did with, with you guys indicate that, you know, 100%, all of you who, who took part in the poll think that oil palm is the main driver of, of uh, fires and haze in Southeast Asia. But to the uh, 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 facts really backed it up. So if you look at this, uh, in terms of the percentage of deforestation that's caused by oil palm, uh, yes, in Malaysia is about 40, what, close to 50% uh, of deforestation, deforestation is, is due to oil palm, but it also means that there's another 50% that's caused by something else that's not oil palm. And, and the percentage is even lower for Indonesia, where it's something like, uh, you know, less than 20% is caused by um, by oil palm expansion. And let's not forget that in Indonesia, you, you have a lot more crops being planted and, and mining is also a huge thing that, 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 that is uh, being conducted uh, as, uh, you know, in, in Indonesia, one of the key drivers of the economy there. So, you know, some these are some of the other causes of, of deposition that's not oil palm. Yeah. And then if you go to the, the northern or the, the, uh, the other countries outside of Malaysia, Indonesia, then, then the causes of deforestation will be something else because uh, you, do, you hardly have uh, oil palm planted in Cambodia or in Myanmar or Vietnam or Laos. So, so there it would be something else. Right? It could be uh, rubber, it could be uh, maize, it could be sugarcane, some other kind of crop. Yeah? So it's important to bear that in mind as well. And then if you see the flip side of it, which is uh, how much uh, of the oil palm expansion actually leads uh, it is actually uh, on forested land because you know there's a lot of oil palm that's planted. Uh, many of the oil palm plantations are quite old. Some of them are planted uh, on, uh, on on top of, uh, of land that used to be planted with rubber or other crops. So you have crop to crop kind of uh, conversion, not necessarily forest to crop. Yeah. So again, the picture uh, differs from from country to country, and in Malaysia, you do still have quite a lot of. Uh, uh, all palm that's planted on, on area that used to be forest, but then in some other countries, uh, maybe the all palm is planted uh, in areas that were previously planted or something else. And then zooming in on Indonesia, specifically Kalimantan and Sumatra, and you just this is looking at hot spots and this is where the fires are. And you can see that, yes, a substantial portion uh, of the fires are in all palm concessions, but you know there are many other categories of land where the fires are. Of, uh, are located, uh, you have fires in protected areas or conservation areas, you have uh, fires in logging concessions, you have fires in uh, non-forested lands that are managed by individuals and communities, farmers basically, um, on pulpwood areas and so on, right? So, so it's not to say that the majority of hotspots are actually found uh, within all palm areas. So yeah, I mean, the, these, these are the facts. I seem to be okay. Sorry. Um, Surin, uh, yeah. you've got another five more minutes. Sure. I'll, Thank I'll you. Just take another five minutes if I can effectively control my slide again. For some reason, I, I uh, can somebody please control. I just want to backtrack a little bit to the previous one. Jinder, could you please control my slide? Because I can't, I seem to have lost control. Somebody? Is it on the... No, could you, could you please uh, move back to the previous slide? Because I, I, for some reason, I've lost control of the, of the slide. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, next please. I'm wondering whether there's, there's, a, there's a problem with my screen because I, I don't seem to see the slides moving. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't control the slides now. 
Um, that's okay, Surin. Uh, maybe what you can do is just, uh, okay, Ajinda seems to be fixing it. Mm, okay, if we could just move back to the last slide that we're looking at and then we move on from that. The next one? Uh, Forward? No, C can you move back please? Uh, to the slide that I was at, uh, now 14, 49. Slide 49, please. Okay, this is the one. Okay, can, can you go full screen on that? Nothing's happening on my side. Apologies, everyone, while we try and fix this little technical problem. Student, what are you seeing on your screen? Okay, oh, okay. right Sorry. now. Thank you. Yeah, if you, if, you don't, if you don't mind, you can just, you know, uh, stay on the controls because I, I seriously am not okay, able to. You need to, to return the control then to me. I <laughs> I don't even know how to do that. Okay, worries. I will sort it out. Okay. Just a minute, right. yeah? Yeah, okay. So let me just continue, yeah? Sorry for the lost time. So, um, yeah, still on this issue about the palm oil controversy. So, I mean, despite the facts that I've shared with you, I mean, it can be denied that there is a huge perception out there that um, palm oil is the, is the main cause of uh, deforestation, climate change, so on. And as you could see briefly in the previous slide just now, the, the, you know, those were uh, some of the key campaigning NGOs and other uh, stakeholders that have been driving this uh, uh, debate on, on palm oil. And, and some of them uh, have taken quite interesting approaches in terms of, address, uh, of, of highlighting the palm oil issue. Uh, you might have seen some of the uh, campaigns that have been happening uh, keep on against Nestle, for example, where you have the killer Kit Kat ad that was uh, uh, splashed all over the media previously. You have campaigners climbing up to, to the build uh, to the headquarters of the Cargill building in the US and unfurling the banners and so on. Yeah. So next please. Next please. Slides don't seem to be changing. Um, okay, uh, uh, while we try and sort this out, I, I believe that all the participants have uh, a PDF of the presentations. If, if you don't mind just referring to them in the meantime, and, uh, and Surin, uh, can you talk without referring to your slides and maybe just-, just Well, I, I, can, I can refer to, yeah. to, to, to my mm -hmm. own screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's try that. Um, hang on, just a minute. Let me just open that. Just bear with me. I'm, I'm opening the slides on, on on my own screen so that I can see what I'm what I'm talking about. Surin, would you like me to share the share the screen and then I'll. I don't mind whoever they're sharing the screen. <laughs> All right. I just wanted so what want we'll the do, slides to work. Sure. What we'll do is I have this. I have the slides with me now. Thank you. And uh, you just could you tell me which slide number yeah. it was? I think it was uh, thirty-seven at that time. All right. Give me just one moment. Thank you. All right. So was it further? It might along. have been um, 50, maybe you can start I, at 50 again. I can't, 50, sure. I can't see my screen though. I can't see any slides on my screen. Um, can you see this? I, I can't see anything. It's just gray. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I can tell you what, what the slide is right now. Um, right, okay. Unless you would like to try sharing it. Uh, uh, yeah, I can try sharing the screen. 
So what right. maybe maybe what I'll just uh, take control sure. of the screen. All right. What I'll do is I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, what do I share screen? I seem to find the icon to share screen. Anyway, let's let's just uh, go, uh, continue. What, what what can you see on your screen currently? Well, currently it's gray. So I think what you're doing is you're sharing. No, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sharing anything. I didn't do anything. All right. Okay. It's not. This, it's not my screen. You're seeing. It's, it's that's that's a gender screen. Yeah. Okay, Surin. Uh, why right. don't you try just doing a verbal wrap up? Okay. Could, could you could you try doing that and then and then uh, if it works again, we can come back to this again. All right. Let's do that. Thank you. Okay. So uh, yeah, sorry about that. Everybody. So basically, I was going to show some slides about the um, companies that are involved uh, in that they are already committed to to uh, sourcing sustainable palm oil. Palm oil. These are the downstream companies, the big multinationals that are buying uh, palm oil, and these are Nestle, Unilever, Mondelez, Danone, PepsiCo. Many of the huge corporations that you are aware of, these are the major buyers of palm oil. They have committed to uh, buying only sustainable palm oil by the year 2020. And then in terms of the production side, some of the major uh, palm oil companies that have committed to producing palm oil, uh, these are the actual people who are planting the oil, palm, uh, the oil palm. These are the companies that have committed to producing sustainable palm oil include uh, Asian Agri, Indo Agri, New Britain Palm Oil, Cargill, Musimas, Wilma, Sandabi, IOI, some of these uh, companies are also familiar to you. So why they want to commit to Sazen Palm Oil is because they can access the gold, global markets. Uh, I mentioned just now some of the downstream companies, the, the consumer brands that have made the commitment. So in order to be able to sell to these uh, major users of Palm Oil, the, the companies need to commit to producing the, the, the so that they can continue selling and continue uh, their business. There's also growing uh, stakeholder expectations out there uh, that they, they, they want to buy only palm oil that is produced sustainably. People are making a conscious decision. They're looking at the contents of whatever they're buying, making sure that they're not buying something that actually uh, is, uh, has got deforestation in the supply chain. So that's, that's becoming a huge uh, part of consumer behavior. And in response, uh, there, there have been a, uh, the creation of a few uh, palm oil certification schemes. We have the roundtable for sustainable palm oil or RSPO um, globally. And then you also have the Indonesian sustainable palm oil or ISPO, the Malaysian sustainable palm oil or MSPO. And within the RSPO uh, principles and care criteria, basically the RSPO standards, there are provisions on uh, on you know new no no planting on peat on the reduction of pollution and emission on not on the the avoidance of the use of fire in preparing the land and also making sure that uh, any new planting does not cause uh, deforestation because when you think of it I mean why would companies plantation companies still want to use fire when clearing their land when obviously there's a lot to lose right because they can also lose their own oil palm trees uh, that get burned by the fire. Uh, uh, they can uh, lose their certification. They can be fined by the government. And, and, and these days, there are many um, uh, ways of disposing of the debris when you're clearing the, the land that you don't need to use fire anymore. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that the, 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 the cause of fire is uh, not not a simple thing. I mean, it's not just a matter of the landowners setting fire. I mean, in Indonesia, for example, it has been shown that quite a lot of the uh, fires are caused by land speculators. I mean, they haven't got the ownership of the land yet, but they want to, to turn the forest or the peatland into bare land so that they can claim the land and say, look, this, this land is, is, is clear, it's not forested, I want to plant something there. So there's a lot of that going on as well where you know, the villagers might be working hand in hand with investors who are living in the city and so on. Right? So uh, it's a very multifaceted uh, uh, kind of uh, situation when it comes to who actually causes the fire. 
Uh, I'll just end with a little bit of information that I picked up from the RSPO, which is the uh, Roundtable for Sash and Farm Oil. They have also uh, started their own fire hotspot monitoring. And then in the year 2019, uh, it was reported on their side that uh, they detected 253 hotspots within the plantation areas of their RSPO members, 253, out of 59,839 hotspots throughout Malaysia and Indonesia. So basically, only 0.39% of all hotspots detected at that particular point in time was actually coming from the uh, oil palm plantations owned by RSPO members. And the huge majority was actually uh, detected elsewhere. So uh, that's just, yeah, give you an idea of, of the, uh, the situation on the ground. So I'll end there. I'm sorry again for the uh, technical hiccups and hopefully we didn't lose too much time. So. Thank you. Over to you again, uh, uh, Surin, for Q&A. Thanks. No worries. Uh, apologies again, uh, Surin, and, and apologies to everybody uh, about the technical uh, hiccup. They, they are trying desperately behind the scenes to fix it. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, just maybe afterwards uh, at the end, just go, go through very quickly uh, your slides. But as, as uh, Ajinda had said earlier, uh, everybody should have a copy of the uh, PDFs of the slides. So you can actually refer to them uh, uh, to the slides that Surin very, very carefully put together for you. Yeah? Okay, um, we're running a little bit over time, but maybe uh, perhaps we could uh, just go with one question that I have. And, and really, uh, it is to address this uh, perception, Surin. Um, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you address this? How, how can media address this, this bad perception that, you know, you, you talk about amazing figures that the RSPO uh, certified plantations, such a small number have fires breaking out, and then they probably put them out very quickly. They're very transparent. They say, okay, we do have fires, but we've put them out, and this is where they are, blah, blah, blah. You know, and yet it's like, aha, you know, your RSPO certified, you should have zero fires. Uh, and then it becomes conflated to the entire oil palm industry uh, everywhere, uh, basically being responsible for fires. Like, how, how can this be addressed, or can it not? Yeah, I'm not sure to what extent it can be addressed. Certainly, the the media has a role to play. I'm not saying that you should suddenly all become oil palm champions. I mean, certainly the oil palm industry uh, are not totally guilt free. They are still uh, responsible for, for uh, you know significant amount of the deforestation. Uh, there are no you know angels in the uh, oil palm industry, but. It's just the imbalance that I think that we need to address, right? Because there are causes, other causes of, of deforestation and haze. So if we are too far more fixated, you, you are losing sight on all the other uh, drivers of deforestation, whether it's the, the maize growers or the durian farmers or, or the, you know, the sugarcane farmers uh, and so on. So that, that's something that you need to, to keep in mind. Also, there's this north-south kind of uh, divergence, right? Uh, the global north, I mean, not, not north and south within Southeast Asia, but the north and south, west, east and west, right? Uh, because, for example, whenever, whenever you have uh, fires, forest fires happening in, in California or in, in Australia, the narrative that you get is that oh you know poor poor people they're losing their home the the forest being uh, cut uh, you know uh, uh, being burnt and all that kind of stuff but you don't have the kind of anger that comes when fires are happening in Southeast Asia right you don't have the whole world being angry at Southeast Asia and saying why are you having fires and why are you not putting out your fires right you don't have that kind of attitude towards the Californians or the Australians when they are have, having fire when they're saying hey you're causing Climate change put, put out a fire. No, we not. We tend to sympathize. Say, oh, you know, we're very sorry that that's happening. So, why do we have that kind of difference in, in perception? Yeah. No, absolutely. This is this is definitely food for thought. And uh, um, well, uh, I think we are due for a break. So we're going to have a, uh, we were going to have a ten minute break. Um, maybe we'll cut it down to about five minutes. Uh, go make your tea or coffee. Go, you know, stretch yourselves and all the rest of it. And, and on this side, we'll try and fix the problem. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. And we'll see you back at uh, 3.05. Oh, sorry, 4.05. I beg your pardon. Going back. Depends where you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, 4.05 <laughs> Malaysian time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I will see you in a bit. Yeah. Uh, I so, think you can have the screen now. All right.
Um, let me try something. So can, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. All right. Gosh, okay. Okay, great. Okay, so good. So that means it's resolved. So um, from now on, uh, what we can do is, I, I will be on this side, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll change the slides for you, um, unless Helena and Mr. Larry you still want to control your own, share your own slides. Larry? On my side, I think uh, you can control it now. Um, okay, sure. I think it should be okay. There must have been some, uh, uh, I think, uh, configuration issues yeah. uh, during yes. that last the few sharing. slides. Yeah. But sure. I think uh, it looks fine now. So yeah, okay. please. Uh, can, can we I, go to Larry's uh, slides and just yeah, go through it quickly? I, sure. I did update it, and so I want to make sure, oh. <laughs> it's the same. sure. Give me one moment. Me one and then after that, uh, Helena, Helena, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I, I will still share my own slides. Okay, so let's do Larry, and then uh, and then we'll, you you just very quickly uh, share yours, Helena, just to make sure it's all there. Thanks so much. All right, so um, Larry, here are your slides. Yeah. So right. Uh, okay. Now you're gonna give me control. Um, I think let's. Well, you want to do it? Okay, just go. Uh, I, yeah. Let's so just it, go. We, we are, yes. So I'll let you know then. Yeah. All right. So we have yeah. We have two I think the, options. the remote control option is, is a bit buggy, so maybe you want to yeah. avoid that. So right, uh, right. just if you can just uh, quickly zip through the slides and then see, I want to make sure it's uh, just by, uh, you know, quick uh, sure. site where it's okay. Go, go, go to the next one, next one, next one, next, 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 next. next. Next, 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 and this should be the last one. All right. Okay. Yeah. The fine. Right. They're updated. Much. Thanks a lot. No Thank problem. you very much. Yeah. And now Helena. So shall I share my slides? Yes. So what you should be you should be able to share it with no problem. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fine. Okay. Brilliant. All right. That's good. Okay. See you guys in five minutes if you want to take off. <laughs> sure.
Hello everyone. Hi everyone. Uh, hope you've had a good stretch, got your tea and coffee. And uh, welcome back to the next two sessions where we will hear from another two wonderful experts. Um, so, right, we'll get going. Um, let me introduce our next speaker. Right, so um, Larry Maramis um, has extensive experience working with uh, the ASEAN um, Secretariat as well as uh, various UN agencies. And uh, most intriguingly, he was actually there present when some of these uh, discussions and the formulations of some of the tools to deal with uh, transboundary haze in ASEAN um, came into being, the birth thereof. Uh, so he's got a real good insider's view. Um, so, you know, direct any questions that you have to him uh, and let's see whether he'll answer them. But before that, uh, Larry, please take it away. Uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting presentation. Thank you, Larry. Sure. Thank you, Xiolin. Uh, I really appreciate being here with you and uh, th having this opportunity to talk a bit based on my experience uh, in on the transboundary haze pollution uh, challenge that ASEAN has uh, really been working with for several decades now. Uh, let me uh, maybe you can start with the with the PowerPoint, or sorry, the slides, Google Slides. I'm wondering if it's already on. Oh yeah, you've got it, okay. So um, what I tried to do, uh, if you can just go before, uh, one slide before, just to refresh the, the audience's memories about uh, what I'm supposed to be talking about. Well, uh, my topic is on the politics of haze and um, in and of itself, a very complex uh, issue, but in particular uh, with with uh, with respect to the ASEAN organization. So I'll try to look in in this uh, uh, presentation to uh, really uh, do a bit of a deep dive on on the the regime, the institutions, and the culture, uh, specifically also the culture, because I think that sort of permeates uh, how ASEAN does business and how it uh, has been addressing uh, transboundary haze. Yes, next. So uh, to be a little more, I guess, uh, creative, and this may be an experiment in futility, but we'll see. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, uh, basically my first part will be talking about regionalism and how that has evolved and how it has changed uh, transboundary haze. Um, and then the second part, I'll try to reverse that and say and see how. Uh, and I'm already, uh, I guess, telegraphing my my opinion on that is that is how transboundary haze uh, has changed regionalism, uh, and it has, as 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 I'll be explaining a little later, it has certainly uh, made a, um, a its uh, mark on on regionalism. But the other aspect of haze that it has also um, uh, nudged at and moved the bar, you might say, on this concept of ASEAN centrality, which is essentially, you know, anything regional, anything in our region that has to do with all of us, all 10 of us in this case, hopefully in, in some point there'll be 11 of us. Uh, uh, this is a shout out to my Timor Leste uh, friends and colleagues. The, that would also change this concept and notion of centrality. And centrality is really deeply ingrained in uh, in ASEAN's diplomacy and its central tenets uh, as an organization. We'll see why a little later. And then, uh, of course, how uh, the changing concept of centrality has changed transboundary haze itself. Then we'll go to a discussion on whether the uh, whether haze, uh, the politics haze, not just politics itself, but the the uh, the political economy, social aspects of haze have been transformative uh, to the organization or really a source of dysfunctionalism. And I put it to you, uh, and we'll have hopefully a discussion after that. So next, please. 
to, to really understand ASEAN, to really get grounded in ASEAN, I've been told that many of you are looking at the polls that some of you have really not been as exposed. And maybe uh, this is a kind of a quick uh, ASEAN 101. Uh, uh, to understand ASEAN, it really has moved uh, and is not a passive organization by all means. It has changed, changed in, in, in good ways, uh, but it has also changed in ways which are questionable. So as you know, it started in 1967 with the Bangkok Declaration. We had here uh, the peak of the uh, Vietnam War. You had uh, basically the region uh, and uh, acting as the proxy of uh, the, 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 the uh, global forces at that time. And uh, um, uh, important leaders uh, uh, basically stood up and, and uh, tried to assert itself and stand aside. And you might remember, you're as old as me, that there was a Southeast Asia tri Treaty Organization that really tried to develop the political security context of it. That was quickly uh, um, dissolved. And this whole notion of an ASEAN uh, association uh, drew support back in 67 with the initial four or five uh, member states. So that's a, a very important landmark uh, for ASEAN. Uh, fast forward by a decade or so, you have then the ASEAN Concord One. And here is the beginnings of uh, trying to describe and, and, uh, and uh, basically stake out an identity for the region. And ASEAN Concord really is an attempt to say, well, these, uh, uh, well to outline the, the parameters of what was later known as open regionalism. So uh, here you have uh, development cooperation initiatives, which are based on the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which is the founding uh, uh, a treaty of the organization. Basically, it sets out the, 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 the terms of, of exchanges, uh, of cooperation, and also uh, it helped to outline uh, what it needs and wants through ex its external relations. Now, several decades later, um, you have the organization really think about, I think hard about uh, what it really wants to be, uh, an, ASEAN, an ASEAN that is integrated, but in, in doing what, to what purpose? So the ASEAN Concord tries to essentially uh, uh, map these things out. They already identify three pillars, and you'll know in ASEAN is when, when they talk about three pillars, it's really about the political security, the economic, and the social cultural pillars. And uh, these have uh, now uh, action plans. They are uh, linked to the Millennium Declaration, the Millennium Deve uh, Development Goals. And uh, uh, underpinning that is the ASEAN Vision of 2020 and an action plan uh, that uh, helps to uh, also solidify that. And because uh, the new members uh, of, uh, of Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, and Vietnam have come in, uh, there was also what they call the initiative for ASEAN integration, which was specifically for uh, uh, helping the other new uh, member states who are very diverse in terms of not just income, but in terms of ideology, philosophy, state philosophy, and so on, to, uh, to come to a common ground through this initiative. And uh, uh, of course, uh, you already had ASEAN establish itself as a regional platform through the ASEAN Regional Forum and uh, this uh, Southeast Asia uh, nuclear, free, nuclear Weapons Free Zone. So fast forward again, another decade, you have then ASEAN redefining itself uh, as, a, uh, as, an, um, as a regional mechanism that is, of, uh, that is going to contribute to uh, a global, global public good. So you have now, uh, several years before that, you had the ASEAN Charter, a new foundation that is beginning, development cooperation starts beginning to assist the uh, ASEAN countries uh, through what is called the Community Roadmap. Uh, that was from 2009 to 2015. Fast forward today, you have now in 2015, of course, you had the announcement of a, an ASEAN community. So ASEAN now is a community, uh, and that's the formal uh, uh, terminology, if we want to call it that. Uh, but uh, now it has a, a bigger vision. We won't go into the vision now, but you could. Uh, it, what's important is that it does uh, evolve through a much more standardized uh, institutional framework, processes, 
And uh, a lot of the activities are aligned through these community blueprints, these three communities, the political security and economic, as well as the social cultural community uh, were uh, much more performance, I guess, uh, oriented, results oriented. Next, please. So in the first two decades, really ASEAN uh, has been uh, uh, doing a sort of regionalism light, right? Uh, 1.0 and, and there it took its cue from uh, many uh, regional thinkers uh, and in a, to, to develop a, 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 an organization that really followed uh, what is called, what was called then functionalism, which was a, really a forerunner of globalization uh, theory and, and strategies. And the thinking really focused on, yes, uh, a cooperative arrangement to, uh, uh, to deal with day-to-day -day, uh, interstate affairs, but also to ha open up um, avenues of supporting each other in health, education, and some transboundary concerns. And among those early transboundary concerns was pollution. So this is important to, to know. And it's also uh, notable that uh, during those years, uh, what, what is now so called socio-cultural, uh, a community was then called functional cooperation. So you do have a very strong link with uh, political science theory, international relations theory that is very uh, evident. And it's, it's, it's not surprising because uh, we do have uh, the diplomats, the regional diplomats really uh, uh, charted the course and laid the foundation for, for ASEAN. Again, uh, fast forward some further decades, you have what is called neo fascism you have what is called uh, national functionalism, and that really uh, takes the cue from the European experience, the European economic cooperation, the, uh, uh, the common market there. And for a long time, ASEAN's thinkers were uh, seen as modeling that European uh, experience, uh, this neo-functionalism experience. But the biggest change, I think, in, in uh, ASEAN's thinking in terms of how uh, the organization should, should involve was really the, uh, the Brundtland report. And that's the, uh, the report by the, um, by the former prime minister of Norway, um, um, Brundtland, who, uh, who also chaired this World Commission on Environment and Development. It was back in 1987. It had a very long lasting impression on uh, the body, the body politic, the, the, the political discourse going on in ASEAN about what is this organization, what should we, uh, we, we, we what are we all about? And uh, there, as you may recall, the Brundtland report really uh, looked at economic growth. They looked at, they essentially uh, identified sustainable development, so the language of sustainable development uh, began to be absorbed by the region, the, uh, the ASEAN uh, community, uh, and I'm talking about here really the, the, the intergovernmental community. And uh, uh, even the concept of sustainable communities. So Brundtland talked about sustainable communities, and this was a very uh, attractive uh, idea. The idea that there are, it's not just one community, but many. And so uh, it had to be founded on multilateralism, interdependence, uh, not just sustainable development. But all that supports economic growth, economic protection, and social e equality. So you do have a much more expansive understanding uh, of international norms that gain currency among ASEAN thinkers. Next, please. So uh, at the same time, uh, this growing body of people, uh, as I call them, you know, the, the functional cooperationists, <laughs> maybe you can call them, they began to shape uh, regionalism in a different way, in the, in, in the Brundtland way, if you want to call it that. They looked at uh, social, cultural, so everything that's not political, everything that's not economic, uh, would be under them. That's the functional, the idea of functionalism, and that uh, it would be uh, looking at developing uh, development or sectoral cooperation. Uh, this old, old fashioned idea of uh, technical cooperation among developing countries, TCDC. That became passe, as you know, and has really been uh, overtaken by this uh, concept of South South cooperation. So that has been uh, a very much within the ethos of, and the driving force of the social, uh, uh, social cultural uh, community. 
the, uh, the growing or the nascent social cultural community. But even within those two decades, uh, there was a feeling of being uh, the third child, uh, the feeling of uh, not being the most uh, uh, well-regarded uh, pillar um, and because uh, much of the lead was taken by the political security and economic cooperation. So you see that, that very much a, um, uh, in, the, in the collective, uh, mood of, of, of those who are driving the uh, ASEAN social cultural commu community. But certainly it's rooted in functionalism, neo functionalism, as you call it, that's the whole I idea of, of integration, of an economic integration, and influenced by globaliz uh, globalization. Globalization, as you know, globalization really gained currency uh, in the last two or three decades uh, because of the concept of of uh, global value chains, of interdependence, interconnectivity, uh, the digital, uh, and all the, the, the changes that were the, the, the so-called disruptive technologies that uh, globalization introduced. Now, why am I um, emphasizing this so much? Because in the end, uh, because of, um, I guess, institutional, the institutionalization of regionalism in ASEAN, the ASEAN social cultural community evolved and it, and it controls in effect how it interfaces with the other pillars. It acts in a sense of gatekeeper. And so this is a, this is an important cultural uh, uh, element or dimension in understanding ASEAN. We, because we have three pillars, uh, rightly or wrongly, this is how the, 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 the founders uh, uh, charted the course. And, uh, and now one pillar, is where all that action is. Transboundary haze happened to be under the social cultural community. Next. So now, while social culturalism or the social cultural uh, community was was uh, expanding from uh, initial of uh, three or so sectors: health, education, labor. Uh, and uh, it started expanding to something over 20 sectors now. But while it was doing this consolidation of all its uh, uh, efforts and this blueprint, uh, of course, the real geopolitical geopolit landscape was, uh, was driven by economic regionalism. And, and uh, this is what uh, I think part of where uh, Surin's uh, uh, presentation uh, also uh, uh, focused on, uh, where uh, uh, there were where the tendency is now to look at uh, a much more integrated ASEAN, but in a very economic uh, point of view. Why was that? Well, one was the fear of fortress Europe. Europe was becoming a, uh, a block in itself, a market, a marketplace uh, where you had to do business through this one window, Europe. Uh, and there were obviously conditions where you had to fulfill to uh, partner with Europe. But uh, also in that, that, that time period of the early 90s, late, late 80s, you had the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement. And uh, the, the member states started getting uh, very, very concerned that they will be missing out. They'd have to also promote themselves as a, a better union. Uh, and Thailand stepped up and said, well, you know, let's not go into necessarily professional trade agreements. Let's go into much wider, comprehensive, all-encompassing AFTA. That's the uh, uh, ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. This is important to understand because it's actually based on this broader economic regionalism that uh, you had uh, ASEAN multinational companies, the uh, Charung Pokpans of the world, you know, the uh, Asia Pulp and Papers, and many of the Asian-based uh, or uh, multinational corporations, transnational corporations, began to uh, assert themselves and uh, be part of the, the body politic. Uh, and you'll see much more in that in, uh, later on. So uh, there's also a fear of China. Uh, China's not, not something new. Back in the uh, late 90s, the ASEAN were very uh, 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 fearful that ASEAN was basically sucking up the, the foreign investments. And so uh, Singapore, as always the case in terms in these issues, 
certainly, uh, st um, stood up and said, look, we have to uh, begin developing this concept uh, notion of the economic uh, community. So this, this, this early beginnings of economic regionalism can be uh, can be really uh, traced to Singapore's own concerns, of course, uh, it led in terms of export or, uh, economy, but also uh, how it saw the world uh, around it. And it's also important to point out that the G5 at that time, um, so they, they had a Plaza Accord, which essentially uh, uh, the US was complaining about the trade imbalances, the trade deficits. Isn't that an interesting thing? Because you know it has haunted us uh, <laughs> For a while now, but in a new uh, iteration, uh, you had uh, uh, basically uh, the U.S. Uh, complaining about uh, the German uh, and the uh, the value of the uh, Japanese yen, the German Deutsch uh, and Deutsch Mark, and the uh, and the Japanese yen, and they wanted a new uh, accord that would allow that. Well, that immediately. Uh, changed the flow of FDI. So these are very important uh, issues to, to remember because once you start opening up FDI, you also have um, um, you have an add-on effect, a piggyback and a tandem effect that uh, our own the regional-based uh, com companies uh, were able to uh, uh, exploit uh, and exploit very well because then you had these large uh, conglomerates, these large syndicates and, and, and cons <coughs> sorry, consortiums, um, uh, they, they, they began uh, the, the early beginnings of a state private sector or transnational sector, uh, transnational corporations uh, already was already beginning to uh, set. And internally Asia, uh, Indonesia, it's again in Indonesia, but not about transboundary haze. Indonesia was because Oil price fell in the, la in the late 80s, and it started to shift to export orientation. Now, Thailand, Philippines, uh, Singapore, Malaysia had already started that, but Indonesia was always the latecomer, and uh, it began to shift. That changed also the whole outlook of ASEAN to become much more of this economic uh, community. Um, you can also thank uh, <laughs> Kunanan Panyarachun in the early 90s, who basically nudged ASEAN to agree to uh, AFTA. Um, not, uh, it's not unusual or not, uh, not surprising that uh, Indonesia was basically pushed, you know, kicking and screaming uh, to uh, agree to the AFTA terms. And uh, of course, uh, once again, Indonesia was a, a critical two upheavals politically because in the 1998, 1997, you didn't only have transboundary haze, you also had the financial crisis. And uh, Indonesia, of all the ASEAN countries, was hit the, the worst. And Malaysia, under uh, 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 Prime Minister uh, Mohamed Mahathir, uh, really wanted to uh, espouse this or to bring this ASEAN Vision 2020 out. Uh, a very, uh, I think, enlightened vision. And we have to credit Malaysia for pushing that. Okay, next. Uh, Slide. Um, sorry, Larry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, giving you another ten minutes. So, sure. um, yep. If you could, uh, you know, I will do that. Um, yeah, I'm almost finished. With, yeah. Thank uh, you. Very I'll much. be going very quickly. So, um, the idea then here is that uh, uh, the, the 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 point is making basically, ASEAN's open regionalism really went through a lot of changes. Uh, it has uh, benefited from. Uh, the kind of uh, political influence that uh, it has in, in this so-called distributed leadership. At one time, uh, Suharta would uh, be calling the shots, another Mahathir, um, um, and then Ramos and so on. So they did really set in stage the, the, uh, 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 the foundation of this uh, uh, open regionalism. And although uh, a lot of people talk about the Ashan way, it's really uh, uh, now we talk more about the ASEAN centrality, where uh, anything regional really has to do, uh, really has to uh, to uh, to be uh, to be through a consensus approach and uh, through uh, through the ten agreeing on uh, what the direction of the region is. You begin to see also the beginnings of uh, institutional culture. I think uh, Helena's uh, uh, um, landmark work 
on on uh, on the politics of haze uh, and regionalism, uh, environmental regionalism. I think uh, is is uh, splendid in that, and, and I think uh, it it really uh, um, bears further review and reading. Next, please. Yeah, so, uh, okay, in terms of how transboundary haze changed regionalism, so we talked a bit about how regionalism began to change uh, 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 transboundary haze, but transboundary haze had a very important role in changing it too. But back in 1990, you already had the Kuala Lumpur Accord on Environmental Environment and Development, uh, 1990, and that really had a very uh, important role, uh, important component on transboundary pollution. You also had the Singapore Summit, that said, and that identified uh, transboundary pollution as a primary, primary environmental concern. Okay, we're not talking about just a concern; it's a primary concern. So, uh, so you could see uh, the the increasing escalation of uh, transboundary pollution as a concern, and you then had the first ASEAN cooperation plan in 1994. And uh, a year after that, the formation of the Hayes Technical uh, Task Force. So uh, you could see a, um, a progression in the, in the way that uh, the organization uh, uh, had uh, uh, considered Hayes. Already in the early 80s, you had some major outbreaks, but not so much major because, as you know, a few years later, next slide, please. A few years later, in 97 and 98, you had these major outbreaks. Won't get into that, but because uh, it was really slightly, uh, briefly covered by Sulin, 9 million hectares were uh, basically um, taken out of existence uh, and largely in those countries that you see listed. It was estimated the loss would be 6 billion, but there's been many studies since uh, that revisited it, looked at the methodologies, etc. that, and you can find uh, you know, even science, as we're saying, could be, um, could sometimes be very, I should say, uh, 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 not, uh, uh, not absolute. So the economic, even the economic loss uh, estimates uh, of those days have been challenged. But against that was the Asian financial crisis, as you know. Um, and, and that, uh, that uh, cause a lot of uh, pain, not, not in terms of how ASEAN sees itself, but how ASEAN addresses the issue of transboundary haze. Next slide. So you then have this very quickly in succession after these uh, different uh, cooperation uh, uh, agreements, frameworks were done, uh, all these different plans. So you had the regional haze action plan, which was my own personal experience of uh, in the in the negotiations in the, the regional the negotiation before present and you'll see the uh, the the um, after that of course uh, three years after that was the uh, ASEAN peatland management initiative why did that happen because the regional haze action plan really covered more uh, responses it looked at emergency responses there was prevention but there was more mitigating and monitoring and it didn't have a uh, a legal framework behind it. They didn't have the legal muscle. That only came in November 2003 with the ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution, which had uh, was which, which is still uh, considered the most uh, the only the, the only environmental agreement that the region really has, and that covers monitoring, assessment, and prevention, technical cooperation, scientific scientific research, mechanisms for coordination lines of communication, simplified customs and immigration procedures for disaster relief. So moving uh, of, uh, of um, supplies and materials uh, to help combat uh, haze. Uh, two years after that, again, the, uh, uh, the, the results of the ASEAN peatland management initiative came about and resulted in the uh, ASEAN peatland management strategy, which provided this common framework specifically for peat, right? And in September 2013, you notice almost a, a, a close to a, a decade has gone until another program uh, comes up that really looked at stakeholders. So there were so stakeholders, including government, private sector committees, and civil society to achieve the goal of the APMS. And finally, you have in August uh, 2016, this roadmap 
uh, on us in cooperation towards transboundary haze pollution control with means of implementation. That is, uh, um, in shorthand, it's called ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN Haze Free Roadmap. That provides much more strategic or action-oriented time-bound frameworks, etc. If you look at this uh, time, uh, this chronology, you could see a lot of uh, 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 concerns. Of course, uh, in '97, uh, uh, at, concurrent with the, uh, the the fires, you had this action plan. Uh, so there was a, an attempt to to respond, and there was some mobilization of uh, uh, of efforts. But there was not a scientific basis to look at, and it, it was really left up to the APMI to help and focus on the issue of peatlands. Uh, without a legal foundation, uh, it was difficult to enforce, to monitor, uh, to draw sanctions, uh, and that was the the the, um, the that is why the ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution or the AATHP was required. You see uh, a, a progression. On that, but you also see uh, a um, a reactive approach where where uh, oh we forgot about uh, haze yeah you know we should have a common strategy about managing the peat and then uh, yeah you know we work with these stakeholders and yet uh, we did not provide the kind of supporting framework they would have and then uh, oddly enough you have this roadmap that says yeah this should be the the broader thing I mean so. From 97 to 2016, you had uh, this uh, ASEAN drawing up a structure almost uh, piece by pie piecemeal and uh, with a lot of gaps in some cases. Yeah, next. And so you have this, uh, this uh, agreement. The agreement, of course, contains these measures which I already uh, described, but it also uh, uh, on the right, uh, column there. It also foresaw the establishment of this uh, ASEAN coordinating center. This is very vital. It really is the linchpin for the management and control of um, of the uh, operations. Uh, for a while, you had these standard operating procedures that were uh, developed, and the linkage with uh, ACC and the national monitoring uh, centers that were eventually established much later, by the way. Uh, they were national action plans, but uh, they lacked uh, an institutional support mechanism, and these national uh, monitoring uh, centers were uh, evolved much later. Uh, we talked a bit about the ASMC, but time uh, actually is uh, constraining me. I will just simply say that the ASMC was, uh, was a facility that had actually predated uh, and ran concurrent to uh, the, uh, the transboundary haze. It didn't look at haze specifically. It provided meteorological information for a bunch of things, such as civil, uh, civil uh, and military navigation, uh, but also in terms of agro meteorology uh, planning uh, for uh, for agriculture um, and uh, forestry. So it performed a number of uh, uh, functions before it was called upon to focus also on the haze. And also at that time, you already had uh, uh, huge uh, technological development and progress in, uh, you know, uh, remote uh, satellite imagery and so on. Uh, and so it's the premier uh, facility in ASEAN for this. There Thank are you. also uh, issues sorry, there. We'll, 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 we can talk about that later. Yeah, so, sorry, Larry. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe you could end here. So this this is oh. a, a really good place uh, to just end, and, and we could uh, come back to maybe your, your other points uh, later. Okay. But yeah. thank you very much for that very um, very comprehensive journey, uh, and and thank you for explaining the processes. Uh, you know how how ASEAN works really. Uh, but perhaps we could um, get some interventions from the other panelists as well. And uh, there's a question here to you. Um, basically, you spoke of the ASEAN way, so this is famous ASEAN way, right? Mm -hmm. To what extent has this policy of non-interference either helped or hindered the process of dealing with transboundary haze issues? Uh, to to help uh, uh, say that again, the, how it helped or hindered? Yes, uh, has, to look at has, the the ASEAN way. Oh, non-interference, yeah. That's right, that's right, thank you. Yeah, and this is the concept of, uh, this should be looked at in the context of the concept of um, centrality, right? Centrality is that uh, the definition of regional activities uh, will, be, uh, will be undertaken 
through a through the ten through the consensus of the ten. Uh, but within the consensus, that consensus is also driven by their own national um, perceptions and national interests. And so, um, undermining or subsuming that centrality is really national sovereignty. So what, what drives that uh, uh, national sovereignty? Well, uh, national interest first, and then uh, comes uh, 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 regional inter uh, interest and see what the, uh, what the, uh, 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 what the, how the negotiations pan out, right? I, I think uh, to, to look at the, that question, uh, you know, this policy is a bit nuanced in some cases, right? There are obviously some countries that um, are very much, um, you know, uh, uh, they cannot drive or they cannot influence international affairs or external affairs if they only uh, are uh, focused on national self-interest. What is self-interest? National self-interest for something like uh, Singapore, which is very export-oriented, has an open economy. Uh, it's uh, attracting uh, advanced uh, uh, research industries uh, uh, and, and, and um, uh, studies in science. Um, would that work in an international relations setting? Of course, it would not. And that's why uh, there are, uh, you know, how non-interference works, works in different ways. And it's usually uh, a factor of how open that economy is um and how liberal that economy is yeah and how much depended on on on, on foreign um foreign investments um and because you know to me the the idea of foreign uh, non-interference is uh, almost <coughs> um you know almost a not even a, a is a non-starter when you talk about non-interference because they because most countries know or most ASEAN countries know, as I told you, Indonesia made that big jump to become much more export oriented. You don't have national interest. Those national interests have become trumped, <laughs> to use probably a very bad uh, you know, uh, pun, to um, by, by international interests, just by the nature and characteristics of our economies. Uh, so uh, it, it ha has not. Now in the early stages, right, uh, you know, there was a lot of nationalism. I was there. I was in these uh, meetings where you know people were shouting each other. You know, I'm, you know my, you know my farmers are suffering. My you know uh, my people are suffering, and and so on and so forth. And you you can't believe the language that was hurled at each other. I will never. <laughs> that'll be maybe a subject of memoirs for those who who were uh, in the negotiating table. But since I was behind those who were behind the negotiating table or feeding information on them, I can assure you, these were not easy negotiations. They definitely brought up, uh, you know, their national interests. And that was the beginning of, okay, um, this is important. This was a time when people had put up their, you know, basically explain what their, their, their real uh, damage and, and what, what hurt has, has been caused by transmitter haze. And that became difficult because they had to bring up evidence. They had to look at, you know, maps. They had to look at uh, telemetry, uh, satellite imagery. So the later on with this, the the language, the tone became a little more subdued and a little more professional, just a little more. <laughs> well, okay. a, little, a little is 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 great. I think you know when you've got ten yeah. countries and and everybody putting um sort of nation first. Uh, so, you know, kind of addressing the issues that were raised earlier in the session as well. Yeah. Uh, Helena, I wonder whether you, you have any thoughts on uh, what Larry has just said, uh, or indeed his presentation, because you've been privy to, to and you've studied actually, done quite a lot of research on, on how, how ASEAN works. Sorry, Helena, you need to unmute your mic. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but Larry, of course, has the benefit of having all the first-hand experience. So I'm sort of a, an external uh, a com commentator or, or, or observer. But what I have been thinking about quite a lot since there was, there was a question on the ASEAN way um, is sort of how uh, we understand the ASEAN way, whether it is um, sort of something that the countries are bound to 
or whether it is something that countries set, kind of use to their advantage when as and when necessary. So I think um, this is something that we can contextualize in haze quite well. So sometimes when you see it suits certain countries, we will see that certain countries kind of forget about the ASEAN way. Um, for example, uh, you know, sometimes Singapore has been accused to be very brash in how they talk about haze and how they, how they demand things and all that. And if you look at the definition, probably that could be considered, you know, this is not very ASEAN. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, sometimes uh, the other way around works. So a country will suddenly claim that, you know, we have to strictly follow the ASEAN ways. It's extremely important. And this has been come up, this has come up during the Hayes negotiations as well. Uh, in relation to sharing the maps. So um, sovereignty issues has been brought up. So I think the ASEAN way is an interesting lens to view ASEAN and also to view the haze, not only in terms of, I mean, to, to think about it, like has it become so ingrained in the ASEAN culture that we can't think of another way to function in ASEAN? Or is it just something of a tool for governments to use to suit their interests. So Larry has of course raised the issue of national interest. So maybe we can leave it at that and we can see whether any others, any other of the journalists may have some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Helena. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, no, there's another question from uh, Adit, but before we get to that, actually, uh, Surin, uh, I'd like to ask you for your thoughts on, on, on uh, what Larry has presented. Yeah, thanks, Helene, and thanks, Larry, for that very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, certainly, for most of us who are not at the negotiation table, we can only imagine what actually goes on there. So I think you've given us an idea of the kind of complexity that's faced by uh, the ASEAN uh, negotiators. I'm curious as to whether, you know, to what extent the, the response to the Hayes uh, issue, and, 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 and you can see from Larry's uh, slides uh, uh, previously, where there have been a, a number of treaties, uh, agreements at the ASEAN level related to the, to, to the Hayes and PEEP and so on, right? So my, my question is, I mean, to what extent have they been, um, you know, to what, what, what has led to this kind of uh, response? Right? Is it mainly due to um, pressure from people in the, in the individual countries? As in, is, it a, is it a ground up kind of uh, 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 impetus or was it mainly due to the techno technocrats that are involved in the neg negotiations? Was it really driven by the, the leaders of the different economies? Or was it international pressure? So, or was it a mix of, of, of the above? So, it would be interesting to, see, to find out from you, Larry. Yeah, Larry, uh, it's great. Uh, you know, a great question, uh, Surin. Uh, I'm just going to interject here a little bit, Larry, because this, it's very similar to what uh, uh, Adib has also asked. Like, who, who makes the final decisions? Who, who are the ultimate arbiters, uh, arbiters in the process? Thanks. Mm. Yeah, um, the final decision makers. Um, well, you know, this is the this is the issue I was uh, was uh, was also going to make in in actually the next slide that I would have uh, presented to you, and um, uh, the easier the, the 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 problem here is that um, the institutionalization of uh, environment has uh, has allowed the technocrats to kind of hid hide behind strategies, action plans, and uh, and uh, the management thereof, right? And the coordination mechanism. So you had uh, this layering of uh, who does what and why and when and why, and um, and then you have essentially a diffusion or a dispersion of accountability. So uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, when when uh, the and this is the problem with international agreements generally. Um, there's a cherry picking as to what an organization can, uh, a country can do, right? That happens even in UN conventions but also on the, the AATHP. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, the question, the, the, my answer to who has that, the, that last role, in the end, nobody does because the, the terms of the, the, the framework is, is, is so vague sometimes that it doesn't as ascribe 
responsibility to one person or one country, that wouldn't happen. That's that is not the ASEAN way, right? You know, it's you know uh, the ASEAN way is look if it's all for one and one for all, why are you blaming me? You are also <laughs> responsible, equally responsible, right? So that is kind of a the 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 excuse often given it's not so much national sovereignty it's like it's more that you know we started this together you know you can't uh, say uh, all the all the initiatives that you put together were in place you were supposed to develop my capacity here and it didn't happen so the expert will tell you that well i mean in in, in cambodia you know the monitoring capacity is x amount of percent as compared to you know Philippines or something like that, so you get that into those number games, and in the end, it's 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 um, it's a lowest common denominator game, right? You say, well, in that case, you know, uh, rather than saying such such country was at fault, that whole there's a whole systemic issue that is at at fault. So this is the 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 problem with this. It's it's the ability of it's not so much the ability, but the the conventions and the agreements that are made are such that it lacks real um, uh, sanctions, right? It really lacks accountability as to who should be responsible for what. And you might have leads, but they're not the ones who are accountable necessarily. They're the ones who lead. So there are other parts of the pieces that need to to do their job. And if they don't do it, then it's not the lead's fault, right? That's the problem with with these agreements. They're so complex, they're so bureaucratic, they're so multi-layered that it's very difficult to really uh, make a deep dive as to who's at fault, who's responsible. Right? You need a new generation of frameworks and agreements that really are much more results oriented, much more accountable, has sanctions, you know, has enforcements, uh, you know. Uh, and addresses this institutional culture, which we, we kind of sidestep, but this institutional culture that is prevalent in these large organizations, right? Um, the UN has face, faces that, and, and, and uh, you know, ASEAN is no different. Mm. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's really, really honest and a, a great insight. We, we look forward to your memoir. Um, there'll be lots of buyers here of your memoir for sure. Yeah, but talking of, um, thank you very much for that, Larry. Uh, I'm going to move on now. We'll, we'll come back to uh, to, sure. to your points, um, many many different points. I'm, I'm sure you know to to pick up on. Uh, but talking of accountability, let's move on to um, Helena's uh, presentation now. Um, Helena is a senior lecturer at the Department of International Strategic Studies at the University of Malaya in KL. Um, her research, she is a real, she's a real pro at, at this whole thing. Uh, we had a question come through the Google form asking about the connection between politics, uh, governance, and, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, deforestation. Uh, let's, let's listen to her. Her research is, is very, very deep. She wrote a book uh, uh, called, um, sorry, she wrote a book called The Haze Problem in Southeast Asia, Palm Oil and Patronage. So there's no one better to talk about patronage and understanding um, backdoor deals or side door deals uh, or, or things beneath the surface. And uh, she's going to try and address accountability. Helena, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Okay, I'm going to make it full screen. All right, so um, I, I probably will not focus so much on, on patronage, but I will talk a bit about governance as we go along. But um, how I decided to approach today was to talk about certain um, concepts that I think might be something appealing or something relatable to the public when we talk about haze. Um, basically drawing attention to what has been some of the interesting trends that I've seen uh, observing haze for the past 15 years um, of how it's been talked about in the media and how we can relate things to certain international relations concepts and certain um, political science concepts that could probably help to uh, substantiate uh, some of the stories that you might think of doing. So one angle that I felt was quite interesting um, was actually on 
Just give me a minute. I want to try and put my timer so I won't go over. Was actually on um, whether we think about these kind of things as crimes. Um, our environment, environment pollution, is it thought about as a crime uh, today? Because um, that's not actually something that is 100% uh, accepted, the idea of an environmental problem. Is it a crime or not? So I'm going to look at it from the context of human dignity and human rights, and we can see what uh, important concepts could be related to this. So um, the idea of whether humans have a right to a healthy environment, this might seem quite obvious to you, but actually um, it is not um, recognized as much as you think. So this idea that the environment is a prerequisite to the enjoyment of human rights. If you think about it, what is human rights about? Um, you know, the, the right to live a, a, a good and comfortable life, basically. But of course, you would need to have a good environment to do so. So we talked about the effects of haze and how haze is one of the, or, or air pollution being one of the major killers uh, and major easily avoidable killers. So obviously, haze would be, in a way, um, um, cutting into our rights as human beings. So related to this idea of, of environmental rights, um, there's things like the right to a safe, healthy, and ecologically well-balanced environment. So whether or not this should be recognized as a human right. And also when you think about it, certain other human rights, for example, access to information, participation in decision-making, access to justice, all this is actually dependent on having a good environment. So without that, we are blocked from, from, from accessing other rights as well. So the environment is really essential for us to have a healthy human rights ecosystem. So the whole idea about linking human rights and uh, uh, human well-being to the environment, we could argue that it started out in 1972 with the Stockholm Declaration. And um, together with the Rio Declaration down the road, uh, it kind of uh, brought about this understanding that, uh, you know, that, um, we, that governments need to somehow take care of their people. And not only their people, um, the people around the world as well. So the concept that, uh, well, it, it gave rise to this international law concept that, that, that goes along the lines of whatever happens in your country, uh, you have to make sure that it does not cause harm to another country. So this is where we start thinking about this responsibilities in relation to transboundary uh, pollution and, and, and the responsibilities that come with it from, from one country to the other. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the UN, uh, uh, the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, Article 3 uh, mentions that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. But it doesn't actually mention um, environment per se, uh, directly. And if you look at um, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, uh, I think, you know, because it's uh, in, in, a, in an earlier or rather in a more recent um, environment, if, if you can call that, um, there has been more of an acceptance of this concept of um, environment being part of the human rights. So um, the Article 28F states that you know the, the humans or ASEAN people of the ASEAN, people of ASEAN have the right to a safe, clean, and sustainable environment as well. And we have other related um, uh, related uh, uh, declarations uh, that that go along these lines. For example, the Singapore Resolution on Environmental Sustainability and Climate Change. Uh, the common stand on, on UNCED as well in 1992, um, they all recognize uh, yeah, the importance of environment for human rights. So interestingly, this has also become um, quite, or rather it, you can see it in a few in, in, in constitutions uh, around the world. If you look at Malaysian constitution, it's not there. Malaysia does not mention anything about the environment in their constitution. It does say something about the right to life, but not particularly the environment. But interestingly, Indonesia, has this in its, in its constitution. So every person should have the right to live in physical and spiritual prosperity, to have a home and to enjoy a good and healthy environment. So this is in the constitution of Indonesia. So it would be an interesting thing for all of you to go back and have a look at your own constitutions to see uh, what, do, what do they say or do they say anything about the environment? So this is a quote that I have gathered. Now this, I'll be showing you some quotes that I've gathered over the years, uh, which I thought was quite interesting and connects to this idea about human rights and crime. So this is something by the former Singapore environment minister, Vivian Balakrishnan. Uh, and now he's, uh, if I, uh, and, and so um, 
he said this, this is not a natural disaster. So this was in relation to haze. This is vandalism against society, against the environment, and ultimately against ourselves, a man-made tragedy and a crime. So um, is this an interesting comparison to natural disasters? Because he talks about this is not a natural, he makes it a different thing. He said, we're not talking about, let's say typhoons, or we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about earthquakes, talking about something that's not natural. So that's why he made the relation to crime. So I think this was a very important statement to make because um, a lot of people still um, may not be able to, 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 to understand that haze is actually something that is um, not, not, not necessarily natural. Uh, and of course, you know, the severity of the haze depends on the weather. If you have a dry year, like if you have a bad El Nino year, the haze is worse. If you have, uh, if you have a La Nina, it becomes less. Uh, but the essential drivers are not natural. Um, the extent would depend on these, uh, on these, on these, uh, you know, um, atmospheric rhythms. But the drivers are still very much human, um, as we'll go into a bit more. And there has been other commentators uh, saying, you know, describing this as the biggest environmental crime of the 21st century. So we've talked, uh, our, our, the other speakers have talked about the orangutans and all this. Um, and of course, the link to, it, to climate change has been made as well. I think something um, really easy for us to envision um, how much actually uh, Surin has mentioned uh, when peat is dried and exposed, uh, it starts the process of, uh, of, of CO2 being released. Uh, and, and, and that is where, uh, a country like Indonesia, for example, which isn't very doesn't really have much industrial contribution to CO2 because you know the biggest contributors are US, China, which are mainly industry. Uh, but a country like Indonesia or Malaysia, we could be contributing so much um, through this, through just uh, exposure and, and and depletion of our carbon sinks. So that is uh, that is really turning its head on this idea about industrialization driving climate change. Um, moving on, so this is, there's this, this is not uh, something that's only being said by other countries, like for example, if Singapore would say it, or if Malaysia would say it, or Thailand would say it, um, that hasn't been the case. We also see commentators and even uh, government officials from Indonesia has been using this kind of language to describe what has been happening. So this is somebody from the Badan National Penanggulan Bencana, so I think it's like Nas 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 Natural Disaster Agency. Um, so he has described it as a crime against humanity of extraordinary proportions. Um, so but when you think about it, actually, the people who are closest to the fires, they are the ones who suffer the most. So it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, stark to see uh, that, you know, uh, the people who are, we may face haze in Malaysia, but the people who are really the most affected are those in Sumatra or Kalimantan, uh, who are really just next to it. Um, so, Back to this concept about a crime against humanity. Uh, so if you look at the definition under customary international law, um, this has been used to describe things like slavery, apartheid, rape, sexual violence, um, this kind of stuff. Uh, so um, it basically means acts that are deliberate. Uh, they are deliberately committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed on any civilian population during peace or war. But when you think about it, actually, should we start considering environmental crimes as such? Because if you think about it, um, environmental crimes, they are caused by most of the time human activities, whether direct or indirect. And, 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 and we know what we are doing. Human beings know what we are doing. So, you know, sort of understanding it this way makes it really something that to, 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 to kind of communicate the urgency and the need to really start thinking about this as a real big um, issue and not just a side effect of development. Uh, you know, just a side story, we, we, we ran a survey before to ask uh, something along the lines of, is a certain amount of environmental pollution acceptable, an acceptable payment or an acceptable uh, side effect of, of uh, development in, in, in KL? And the surprising thing was about I think it was like 30 to 40% actually said yes. So, you know, this is something um, that perhaps we have to start thinking about how society understands um, environment and development, right? So if you don't think this is something, um, it's just a big problem and it's something that you just have to deal with as a developing country. Uh, so this is a picture about um, the, I think a very 
uh, a resting picture of an entire um, an entire how to say mountain on fire in in Chiang Mai, and I, I have a good friend who lives there, and um, yeah, so it, it's it's really when you just look at it, it's it, it's terrible, and this is not even on on peatlands, right? Uh, it's in Thailand, and um, it just shows that. Again, it's not just a southern problem, it also happens uh, in the Mekong area and it's equally uh, or, or I mean, all, just as bad or even worse uh, than what we have here. Um, so serious, so definitely the people of Chiang Mai, you know, what are their rights, right? Um, and coming back a bit to, to Indonesia, these are some figures of um, what were the human costs uh, of haze. And what I do want to call the, your attention to is the 19 deaths at the top. So this was actually caused some controversy at the time uh, because uh, around the time where these figures were released, a few years later, uh, scientists had done some research and they actually said that these 19 deaths are super, super underreported. Uh, and they said that the range, the actual range of deaths related to the 2015 haze was about 40 to 100,000 deaths not 40 to 100, 40 to 100,000. So we can see here that there's a lot of un underreporting going on. And the reason why the figures were so, were, were so small, um, the official figures was because these figures were the people who officially dropped dead during the haze due to um, lung issues. So of course that would have been probably 19, fair enough. Uh, you know, those people who also were close by to the haze. But when you take other considerations, people who were very who were sick before became extremely sick because of the haze and died later, for example, or people who started to get sick because of the haze and had had problems following that even beyond the haze season. Taking all those into account, uh, there's a much bigger number of effects on, on onto the human uh, well-being and the impact. And that study actually covered not only Indonesia but also Malaysia and Singapore as well. So the the effects are really quite. Uh, quite broad. Uh, this is a picture which perhaps you would have seen taken during the 2019 haze uh, in Riau. Uh, and I think you guys will remember the red sky phenomenon in Riau. And actually, um, just to mention, I was, in, I was in Sydney for a few years for my studies. And there was one day that I woke up to exactly this as well, a red sky in Sydney. So you may not think that this happens elsewhere, but it does as well. And it happened before. Um, this happened in Riau. So um, yeah, it, it just shows how, um, how much of an impact uh, uh, it can have. And you know, Sydney at the time, they were having, they were having their own, own, own wildfires as well. Um, so basically, where are our rights to a good and healthy environment? And in, most importantly, who uh, should uphold these rights? And back to, the, back to the quote of the person from, from the National Natural Disaster Agency, National Disaster Agency. Um, so he made this statement before saying that 99% of these fires are lit intentionally. So the question um, comes, um, are they deliberate? And to what extent are they deliberate? And um, I must say that this quote was taken about 2015. And I think things have changed on the ground a lot. So like what Surin has talked about, um, and I want to call, call your attention a bit to this, this question about intentionality in, 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 um, in the fires and, and how we can interpret that. And I think this is a lot of avenue for sort of investigative journalism um, in this problem because a lot of things are developing, a lot of things are changing on the ground, a lot of, a lot of patterns um, uh, on the ground is shifting. And I think it's very important for us to dig down and for you guys to dig down as journalists to get the real story. So um, if we look back at the definitions of the crimes against humanity, um, the definition as well is it's, I, it, sometimes it can be part of government policy or white practices of atrocities tolerated or condoned by a government. So we see that there's a bit of responsibility or there's quite a bit of responsibility put on the government. And this is where I want to bring in governance issues. Um, and I want to talk a bit about uh, what Surin has also touched on about peak drainage and um, about how things have changed. So indeed, in the past, before pre-RSPO, um, companies would have been burning and, and that, that was uh, acknowledged a long time ago. Um, however, you know, once people started to realize, uh, once there were a lot of media exposure about this, people getting angry at the companies, 
a lot of these big companies have stopped doing it because they just can't afford to have the bad, uh, the bad publicity attached to, to it. Uh, so there's been a lot of change, as Surin has said, a lot of these companies have adopted RSPO. RSPO doesn't allow you to burn. RSPO doesn't allow new plantings on peat. But the key here is that um, the, the key is still peat. Why I say that is because these companies, they establish themselves on peat. And, you know, um, one cycle of palm oil is like 20, 25 years. And um, they are there. The very fact that you are on peat uh, makes it very fire prone. Uh, there's no two ways around it. If you are there, it means you are just contributing to the risk. So companies usually they have a lot of money to maintain. They have their, they have their uh, fire engine. I mean, uh, what do you call it? Firefighting teams, and they have their people, the engineers, to monitor the water levels and all that. But the problem is that um, peak domes are usually very large. So you can see this image here, because the reason why I showed this, which is the same one that I believe that Surin has shown, is that even though you see that the, 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 the ditches have been dug only on the left side, you will see that eventually the whole peat dome becomes dry and, and drained and the whole peat dome becomes destroyed. So this is one of the problems of governance that was in the past with Indonesia and even with Malaysia. Peat, peat uh, ecosystems were not considered a unitary um, ecosystem. So you would have situations where plantations were given land on let's say half the peat dome and they would take care of it relatively well. But then you would have this interesting thing where you would have fires just outside the plantations. So why is that happening? That is because the peat dome is such a way that even though when you drain one side, the other parts get dry as well. So you would have these fires that are outside the plantations, uh, or you would have um, uh, villagers who are, who, who are living around the plantations. They're just trying to, to grow their plants and their, their crops and all that, but something happens there. And because the land is already dry because of the drainage that had occurred, the fire, the fire starts. So because of that, there's a lot of indirect um, effect. And so I think this is something that we need to understand. So when I went for my field work, something really interesting that I found was that villagers who were living close to plantations, they actually complained and they said, because the plantations are taking care of their water levels in their plantations so well, the villagers don't have enough water during the dry season because all the water is stuck in the plantations because they don't want the fire to occur there. So there's all of these knock-on effects and, and the, the fact still remains that a lot of these plantations have been there and are going to be there for a long time. Um, and because of that, um, you have to, these are things that you have to actually go and talk to people to find out the real story. It's not just a straightforward story of somebody lighting a fire. There's a lot of these other stories as well. And you know, when a plantation is established, people will come, the roads are built. If the peatland was not open, nobody would even go there. So it's all about, you know, the, the pros and cons about opening up and then managing it or just not opening it up at all. And that's what I think continues to be a problem. And yeah, so this is just, you know, how it looks like. Um, currently, Indonesia is moving towards a hydrological unit uh, way of governing peatlands. And this is, I think, on the right direction, because what it means is they're not going to start giving out like half of, uh, you know, the, the dome has to be managed as a whole, not just partly. So they're moving towards better forms of management. And I know I'm running a bit out of time, so I'll try and go a bit faster. Um, so, you know, these are some, some of the laws that exist in Indonesia, for example. Fires are not allowed to, it's an environmental crime, basically, it's in the law. Um, however, if you see recently the omnibus law that everybody talks about, it removes uh, the strict liability um, um, sort of concept, which means that if a fire is in your land, you are automatically responsible for it. So it softens it. It doesn't remove it entirely, but it softens it. So it's kind of a rollback of, of trying to get, um, you know, people to be more responsible of taking care of their land. So that could be a, that, that, that is um, not a very good sign, but there are also good things. Uh, like, for example, like I said, the hydrological unit thing is being strengthened. So this is also another statement that was in the Constitution of the Republic of Indonesia, the land, the waters, and the natural resources within the state under the power of the state should be used to the greatest benefit of the people. So just to point this out, um, the state should be responsible for the well-being of the people. So I think that's really important uh, to, to think about when states, you know, they're of course, they are interested in development, 
they want to make sure that they develop um, you know, GDP and stuff, but states must also remember that the people are, without the people, they are, they are nowhere, right? So this is, comes back to the idea of human rights. Um, and Pat Larry has touched on this, so I won't anymore, but just sort of the transboundary perspective, uh, which is my last uh, slide, um, is that basically, uh, like Surin has mentioned, the politics of it all, the simplicity when people don't look at the complexity behind it, um, it makes it also difficult for countries to react properly. You know, so like if everybody is just saying, oh, palm oil is bad, for example, um, it makes it very difficult for Indonesia and Malaysia to take responsibility because they might say like, oh, if I say yes, um, there has been some fires, then it's going to be bad for my country, you know. So um, it makes it difficult for countries to also uh, make statements and make decisions uh, because um, people just understand things in black and white. And so countries really have to think about, you know, what will happen to my industry? What will happen to, to you know, things like this when they, when they make decisions? So I think it's very important to look um, at the bigger picture and try to get deeper uh, in and not just things in black and white. So, for example, this is a quote just very recently, you know, when talking about um, the link of from fires to palm oil. Of course, fires don't occur. I mean, palm oil plantations don't generally use fire nowadays. But like I said, you know, they are indirect ways. But these ways are not talked about because they're just so scared. Indonesia and Malaysia are just so scared that it will make it worse for the palm oil industry. So things are just being trying to be depoliticized so much that it becomes really bad to even move forward. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about the Transboundary Haze Pollution Act, which we already touched on, if I'm not mistaken. But this is an example of criminalizing haze because it literally creates a law to say that if you create haze in Singapore, we can go after you using the law. So this is an example of it. It hasn't been able to be used effectively, but this is just an example of a country trying to really criminalize um, a, a violation of, of human rights. Yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helena. That was, that was brilliant. Uh, and you've, you've also uh, touched on all the different points that we've tried to raise in our previous um, sessions as well, in our previous presentations. Uh, I just want to mention uh, just a couple of points. Uh, you talked about the science of it, uh, and that's absolutely critical. So we can't emphasize that enough, uh, that if you want to cover something like the haze, uh, please do try and look at the science, talk to people who know what they're talking about, understand the science a bit, and it actually makes um, reporting richer uh, and absolutely more accurate, right? Uh, you also talked about marginalized people which is again, something that perhaps might need a little bit more attention on. We're always talking about countries fighting against each other, uh, you know, or ASEAN uh, regional fora, which are also important, but let's not forget those who are marginalized, people living right on the edge of a, a plantation uh, on peatland who have no water. Um, is that being reported enough? Why is it important to be reported on here? Uh, and obviously the COVID impact, uh, basically of something like the omnibus law, this direct uh, consequence of COVID and of, of them trying to deal with the economic fallout of, of this, this terrible, terrible ongoing pandemic. Uh, so, so all these different things uh, are things to look out for. And it's not just for Indonesians to report on things like the omnibus law because it affects other countries as well. So, so uh, yeah, those, those were some of the points that, um, that struck me. I have a question for you, Helena. Um, and it's also related to something that Surin had said, right? Uh, government figures, um, gross underreporting. I mean, 100,000 deaths and you say, okay, 19 people died. I mean, that's almost a farce, right? Uh, this kind of underreporting, I think it's like, you know, we've, we've got to save our own asses kind of thing. We, we have to look after ourselves, you know? Uh, and as we mentioned, uh, conversely, that when the government tries to put out uh, figures about, okay, this, this, this is actually what's happening on, on palm, palm oil plantations in Indonesia, people don't believe them. So, so this, this whole thing about like, people not believing anything that government says, I mean, how can we overcome that? How can media, what should media do to overcome this distrust and cynicism over government figures? Yeah, that's a, that's a really big um, issue, I think, in the whole sort of palm oil conversation. Um, so, you know, uh, it's sort of a chicken and egg situation. We don't, we can't really trace back where it all started. Uh, but I think one of the important things that we can look back on is that a lot of the governments that, um, or the Indonesia, Malaysia even, um, 
tend to react very defensively when it comes to uh, these uh, accusations, you know, and not only um, just like as a group, like Indonesia and Malaysia against the world, but even Indonesia defensively against Malaysia, like what you, the example that you have shown, you know. So um, when this happens, it becomes very hard to even um, be trustworthy, even when you do put out proper figures, uh, well-researched figures, uh, people will always not take it very seriously because the first thing that you had said was that, no, none of my companies have burnt, for example, like what Malaysia said. And then when they do come and look, give you some figures, they're like, but you just said that day that we, you are entirely not at fault. So how come suddenly now you are trying to justify and stuff like that? And I think this is what um, is facing, like what Indonesia and Malaysia is facing against the EU right now. So when you know EU is trying to have certain restrictions on palm oil for, uh, for, for, for biofuels, and then Malaysia and Indonesia is trying to say, no, but look, our calculations show that we are doing all, all right, you know, and you should give us a chance. Um, but um, the EU is just saying, oh, we don't believe you. So that's, uh, and, and, and you know, that's again comes down to the science, even though you are studying the same thing as you would know with climate change science, the answers can also be very different. And even within Malaysian uh, uh, scientists, you would see different, differing views as well. Some scientists would say, we can manage peat. Some scientists would say, no way, you should not even touch peat. So the science is also out. Um, the government is not, uh, is not, being, is not being very co cooperative. The answer first is always just no. Uh, you did this, no, we did it. And then like, oh, actually like this, like this. So it, 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 it lends, uh, it, it makes things like the MSPO, ISPO, not as strong as it could have been. And even RSPO, uh, just because of association, it started in Malaysia. You know, even EU is saying maybe RSPO is not even strong enough now. And they're looking at their own mechanisms. So I think it's a problem of our doing. Um, and we really have to work on our PR actually. Um, and, and to the key, like what Surin has pointed out is to make the world understand that not all palm oil is the same and there is sustainable palm oil out there. And, 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 and we are working very hard to go towards that. And palm oil should not be just looked at as a broad brush. You should be supporting sustainable palm oil. Um, so that there's an initiative and there is a economic incentive for more companies to go into sustainable palm oil. Because at the moment, it's not profitable. Companies are just doing it because if not, they will be vilified in the media, but it's not profitable to do so. So unless it becomes profitable, unless it's a demand, there's enough demand, um, it won't be worth. The companies now will just be whatever, there won't be new companies picking up because they were, the ones who are already there are the ones who can afford it. The ones who are not there are looking at the market. If it's worth it, I will become sustainable. If it's not, I'm not going to waste my money. So that is the problem now. You have to communicate, the media has to communicate that sustainable palm oil is a thing um, and it's a thing to be supported. Yeah. Sure, great, great, great. That's really good. Um, I'm going to go on to another question, which I'd like uh, to address to everybody, actually. And this, this, this is about the notion of crime, right, that, that you had raised uh, I, I, when I first heard about this, this approach of yours, I thought this is very fascinating because it's something that I think media don't really cover um, <clears throat> because it's complex. It appears to be uh, a very big topic to understand. Um, <clears throat> so, so my question to you and, and to the others as well. Uh, so first to you, uh, Helena. Um, saying that there's a crime implies that there's a criminal. Okay, now I, I think for myself on, on the part of media, it's, it's very easy to say that's the bad guy, uh, we are the good guys, or you know, that like palm oil within Malaysia are the bad guys and they should be punished. So the, the palm oil companies operating in Indonesia are the bad guys. So, so, so you know, so they're, they're, they're the criminals and they should be punished, right? Um, now, now, how does that affect transboundary haze narratives in the media? Does it reduce the sense of responsibility when you say something like that, is it a crime? Okay, so that's, that's for you, Helena. So I'll just get the questions out to all three of you, yeah? Um, for Surin, um, how, how would you respond to that, okay? Uh, to that same question, but also in context of another question that has come in, how does good governance effectively curb deforestation? So again, 
good governance means there's bad governance. Does bad governance means there's criminals involved, yeah? So just hold that thought, I'll come to you. And finally to Larry, uh, how would ASEAN uh, take to, to uh, considering uh, transboundary haze as a crime against humanity? I think we might know the answer to that. But anyway, um, so, so Helena first, please, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a very sort of broad question. Uh, maybe I can contextualize it um, in terms of, uh, well, what I, what I work on, which, which is patronage, which I didn't talk about directly, but maybe I can just link it here a bit. So thinking about who's actually at fault. So for example, back in the day when I was doing my research, when there was actually still a lot of fires happening on plantations, um, patronage was something very important because what we found was that Number one, um, you know, palm, palm oil should not really be on, on peatlands in the first place because it is protected lands most of the time. So the very fact that plantations are even established on peatlands, um, that itself is a crime in a way. It's against environmental law or rather against the regulations. So you would see then this is the start of the, or rather the evidence of the patronage culture. Um, how, how, are, how is it possible that these plantations could end up on peatlands? Um, that's because you know, there's a lot of collusion going on in getting licenses and subverting EIAs and stuff like that. So there's a lot of collusion between the government and the plantations as well. And everybody knows that this is something common in Southeast Asia, right? There's a lot, there's very close relations between uh, governments and, and big companies, powerful companies. So that itself, when you already establish yourself in the first place in a circumstance that is beneficial to you, it becomes very easy for you to get away with a lot of things. So in the past, even though there were fires in plantations, they were using fire, hardly anyone uh, got, got um, caught for it, right? Um, I, in, in, my, in my field work, I've heard stories like, for example, um, uh, uh, what do you call this? The policemen will come and investigate the fires, but they will purposely investigate during uh, Friday prayers. So nobody is around. So they'll, they'll be like, oh yeah, we went, but nothing, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a collusion thing that's happening. And even if, if something goes to court, you'll get thrown out and stuff like that. So who is who is the criminal here? Is it the court? I mean, is it the company or is it the government? That's why I say the governance is actually on the root of this. And, 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 and connecting to that, um, this idea of criminality as well, uh, like that's why I say you have to look at it in a landscape approach. Um, you know, companies, they are there. They should be responsible for their villages who are around them, for the whole area. But then, you know, they just say that, oh, it's not in my land. It's not my fault. So, of course, we cannot say that it's their fault. But then, you know, this is why it's very important for things like RSPO, which encourages community relationships, community um, arrangements, where they sort of help each other and all that. So I think this is also part of the socialization that happens with uh, sustainable palm oil practices. Um, so I think uh, it's not always very clear the exact person who is the criminal. And this is the problem that Singapore faced uh, when they tried to implement their Singapore transboundary law. Um, so it's very hard to pinpoint, number one, which, uh, which company was the one who was causing the exact piece or the exact uh, PM 2.5 that reached Singapore, number one. And it's hard to also try to pinpoint the person responsible. Is it the company? Is it the CEO? Is it the manager? Um, so it's a whole complicated thing. And I think they haven't actually sorted it out yet. Uh, it's something very new. So we can't really blame them. No other country has something like this. Um, but that's why it's a, it's a new area in law that I think uh, needs to be developed as well. Yeah, thank so, you. So, so, thank you very much. Yeah, that's something that journalists could perhaps uh, uh, try and try and look into, and, and just to exploit from the legal point of view. Um, Surin, your 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 comments, please, uh, in terms of governance, deforestation, uh, and crime. Uh, many things to unpack there, so I'm not too sure how to address it. But maybe just talking about crime first. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a good point raised, right? That if you you say it's a crime, then there, there has to be criminals out there, right? And then you go after the criminals. But that's a, that's kind of like saying, okay, there's a war on terror, there's the terrorists out there, and then you're gonna go after the terrorists, right? So if you if it, if you use the U.S. response, they 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 go they fly in with their drones and their missiles and start attacking another country. So you can't use that kind of approach. With, with the haze problem in, in ASEAN, right? Because you can't, you can't just simply blame a particular group of people, right? 
uh, there there's no single criminal there's uh, and 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 different people may, may may share a certain part of the blame and they could be part of the supply chain right so imagine it more like a supply chain different parties are are guilty at different stages so there's just no single criminal involved here you and i are also guilty to a certain extent if you are buying products that are part of the supply chain that causes deforestation uh, uh, you know clearing of peat and 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 fire right and and that's why the, the response to that should be that let's support sustainable products because if you buy RSP certified products then you have a certain kind of uh, um, confidence that that it, that it 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 did not come from a place where there was uh, fire uh, being used and uh, which has led to 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 the haze, right? So and 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 yeah. So in in that sense, you know, uh, companies that does not have a sustainable uh, uh, farm oil policy should be blamed. Company uh, and these include the, the downstream companies. That are buying the palm oil and the the oil palm uh, companies themselves who are who are planting the palm or oil palm and may have cleared uh, the the area, but but then uh, it's 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 not an easy situation, right? When you have smallholders and smallholders, there are thousands of them. Can they be expected to be able to produce sustainable palm oil? Because as as Alina said, you don't actually get much from planting. Uh, palm oil that's uh, you know that certifies as sustainable. The cost of the certification may be, be more than whatever premiums that you can get. And then going back to my earlier uh, 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 argument as well, it's not just all palm. You know what about the other crops? What are the certification systems available for those other crops? Are people actually demanding that those other crops are produced sustainably uh, as well? So I think this is where the battlefront should be where as consumers, you demand that all these things are produced sustainably, not just palm oil, but also maize, also sugar cane, uh, livestock, you know, uh, and, and so on. So hopefully, when, when people are demanding these things, then then the, the steps would be taken to, to address those issues. Okay, thank you very much for that. Let's look at the supply chain. Let's look at uh, individuals like you and I. Uh, let's 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 be very comprehensive about you know where to to lay the blame if there is blame to be laid indeed yeah uh, talking of laying the blame um, uh, Larry um, ASEAN how do you think ASEAN would take I'm, I'm pretty sure this has been uh, might might have been uh, forwarded to them like crime against is transboundary uh, pollution or transboundary haze a crime against humanity how, how you know what, what what say ASEAN well, ASEAN is not, um, is still, uh, like you said, work in progress on that. I think uh, if there were, uh, if, if there was a, a body in ASEAN that would be able to, uh, to, uh, to provide some guidance, it would be the ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Transnational Crime. Now, it so happens that the, um, that the ASEAN Action Plan on uh, Transnational Crime also uh, references environmental crime. But it's not codified, right? So there's no real, as uh, I think Helena already pointed out, there's no real definition of that. So uh, there's been more emphasis on transnational crime like uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, drug narcotics, uh, and of course uh, the 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 entry point in my mind, if you want, to, if if it has to be through the entry point of um, transnational crime, it would have to be um, uh, illegal logging. Uh, wildlife, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, trading. So through the CITES, right, the Convention on uh, um, International Trade on Ex um, Endangered Species. So um, to me, that would be the proper way. But uh, like many things in ASEAN, it's, it, it's very driven by the, the, the enforcement agencies in this case, right? So it's the, the, ministry, the home ministries, it's the uh, those who are uh, looking at uh, the, the the enforcement, not so much the um, the prosecution uh, of it, uh, and it's left to the environmental ministries. And I think uh, one of the things that we've 
we should note, of course, in, in Indonesia, you've we've combined those who provide license to the forests with those who are actually regulating the environment. So the uh, the ministry is, you know, has this kind of dual personality. But you know, these are just uh, a specific uh, uh, um, case study that we need to be studying a little more as to what is what has been the impact of this. But the point is uh, really, I think, uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, I think uh, criminality and uh, the criminalization of um, environmental crimes has to uh, has is still a long way has yet to be codified, standardized in terms of definition. If uh, there is, however, at least a platform through the action plan, the action plan very, uh, makes very clear references to environmental crime, and it also lays out uh, a number of um, properly uh, priorities like uh, information exchange, legal matters, uh, law enforcement training, and also institutional uh, capacity building through this uh, this the center for the ASEAN Center for Combating Transnational Crime. Perhaps that could be expanded. Its its uh, mandate could be expanded in, in this particular area of uh, of environmental crime. But that, of course, uh, presumes uh, that there are other other activities. And here, the environment ministries have to take a, take the uh, the lead in defining what are environmental crimes. I think that's how it would work. I mean, very bureaucratic, but that's that's sure. you know uh, that's how it would would actually uh, be initiated and it's possible i think it's definitely possible oh that's 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 really really good to hear yeah well we've got um we've got three minutes and that leaves each of you one minute to give the journalists um a take away uh, uh how would you okay just a final message from each of you uh in one minute to the journalists uh we start with you larry one minute. <laughs> Sorry, you need to unmute, unmute to your microphone, please. Unmute myself. Yeah, yeah I think if there was something that I would be really uh, uh, zeroing on in on 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 uh, the ASEAN uh, uh, in transboundary haze, how it addresses transboundary haze, it's really um, in the area of. Um, uh, you know, uh, of institutional government governance, right? I think that's already been mentioned. There's been a lot of progress in overarching institutional frameworks and in strategic planning, etc. There's not so much been uh, um, attention being drawn up on, on on sanctioning, and I, I briefly touched on this before. You know, on, on enforcement, um, on issues of you know um, what is the consequence of uh, of uh, of these crimes. So I think it's good that we ended up on crime because that indeed is should be the trigger point for what what happens next in terms of you know the the net result. But behind that, there are these issues that I think also need to be uh, undertaken. I think the, the journalists would really look into um, uh, uh, what has been the national and regional experience in uh, uh, addressing this in, in terms of. Um, you know, um, uh, unmet goals, timely inputs, capturing the knowledge, you know, and, and moving away from this captive institutional culture. I think that would be uh, the area that I would uh, explore further. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Larry. That, that, that's great. Um, uh, moving on to Surin next, please. Yeah, thanks. So I think uh, to me, uh, this issue of, of, of transboundary haze, deforestation, fires and so on, there, there are many dimensions to it. And, and, uh, and it's a very rich source of, of you know, stories that, that the media can, can pick up on. So it doesn't always have to be on a macro level. It can be very human. It can be very, at a very personal level. You can focus on particular communities or societies that are impacted. You could focus on certain minority groups that are affected. Uh, uh, suggested by Alina. Um, you can, yeah. There's so many angles that you can you can focus on. I think that I think that we need to hear those kind of uh, stories and try to avoid the kind of very common or even cliched narratives that we get to hear about his. You know, it seems like whenever we hear a story about his, this kind of uh, 
you know, narratives are repeated, you know, whether it's the orangutans that are displaced, so, you know, the oil palm companies that have to be blamed and so on. I think we need to move away from this very kind of narrow viewpoints and, and actually uh, expand the scope and, 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 you know, let people uh, understand the, the, the broader perspective related, uh, related to the issue. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Surin. Uh, and, and finally, Helena? Uh, okay, uh, just going back to what Surin also mentioned, I think I also want to remind everyone about the Mekong part of the problem as well. And also, I am guilty of that also. I started out looking at, at, at the southern problem and I um, haven't moved on too much from there. But, you know, um, uh, haze in ASEAN is not a single problem. There are sub-problems to it. And the story of the drivers in the north is different than the story of the drivers in the south. For some reason, the south gets talked about more. And I think that um, has led to things like, for example, ASEAN having whole programs for peatlands, but not programs for the types of agricultural land that exists in Mekong that is on fire, like what you saw so the picture that I, that I showed about the mountain being on fire. So it has indirectly or unnoticeably sort of um, ASEAN has focused, media has focused, academics have focused on the South. Um, and there's this hidden problem that is, is happening in the Mekong that I think warrants so much more, uh, not, not only local attention, it has to be regional, it has to be global as well. So I think um, that story needs to be told a lot more. So I'll end there. That's, that's, that's really great. a really, really pertinent reminder. And I think there's, there's lots of opportunity here for collaboration. Uh, so as ASEAN is trying to get together uh, at a governmental level, uh, perhaps media, uh, across ASEAN should also start working together, uh, share stories, share solutions, uh, and, and there, there might be very, very interesting products out of that, and uh, there's funding available. Um, there is one last minute question that's come in. Uh, Danny, may I get your permission to, to just uh, get, get the folks to, to answer this? Yeah, let's just, let's just go with that. Thank you very much, Danny. Yeah. Okay, so a question from Indonesia. Um, so let's see, how, how can we demand better responsibility from ASEAN in addressing deforestation and transboundary haze. Um, Larry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're alluding to this in, in Helena's uh, segments where we're really talking about, um, you know, how much harm, uh, how much is affecting the citizen, the, the regular, you know, uh, the people who are, whose livelihoods uh, are, uh, are affected by, by that. So, uh, to me, uh, the um, an emphasis on getting better, more voices, um, uh, ensuring that uh, you know you have a level playing playing field. Uh, you know these negotiations that are taking place are always uh, you know state level or, or um, governmental level, uh, and 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 increasingly uh, private sector. Uh, yeah, so company or private sector and government level, so business to government kind of thing. But it's really not a, not a, uh, an emphasis on on um, the community. Uh, we all talk about social forestry, um, and there's been a lot of advances in social forestry, of course. But one of the things that the biggest advance is how 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 technology has uh, allowed uh, uh, local communities to also uh, have their voices. So I think the 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 way to uh, have better response, if that's what we're really the aim of that uh, question, better responsibility. It is to get a better informed uh, citizenry and uh, those who are affected the most. I think that's uh, really uh, what needs to be focused on. Thanks, thanks very much. A great answer, Larry. Uh, I, can't, I can't top any of the uh, sort of uh, points that have been made. Huh? So the, 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 the three asks from the three panelists, uh, lots and lots and lots to unpack. From, from these uh, last few hours. Uh, it's going to be available, I believe. Uh, so uh, on Facebook, uh, the recording is going to be available. So uh, please go back, share it with your colleagues, uh, collaborate, I think. Uh, as I said, again, I'll just repeat that there's funding available and Danny's probably going to repeat that again. I hope that uh, you guys think of, um, that media thinks of interesting uh, ideas. Uh, researchers who have joined us today also think of interesting ideas uh, to bring forward the conversation, uh, to bring forward solutions, uh, to this very, very complex 
problem called transboundary haze. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dan. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Siulin, uh, Surin, Elena, and uh, Larry. Um, so to our colleagues in the uh, Siulin is right. There is a, there are grants available. I think uh, we are already in conversation in most of your newsrooms about um, uh, working on the grants. Uh, do come back to us if you haven't uh, on the kind of story you're going to write uh, on that story project. Of course, uh, um, I think there's uh, plenty of content today already that uh, if you wish to write something on, uh, you can. And uh, I'd like to, I like to um, uh, tell you guys that um, uh, you can still raise questions to the experts, uh, the panel here. Um, I just direct it to us. Uh, I have added, or we have added, the team has added the different, uh, the various journalists who are in the in the group into a journalist WhatsApp group. Um, so to those of you who want to, uh, you know, it'd be it'd be great. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great um, uh, thing that we can get from this uh, project, so that you guys uh, have a chance to network. Um, Julie mentioned that uh, there are there's the recording is available. And in one two days, we will put it. We put the recording up uh, in the in that group, and we will send it out to you guys. Uh, those of you who are not in the group, if you want it, um, uh, pretty soon the recording for masterclass one and two will also be uh, uploaded to the C4 website, and uh, the transcript will also be done as well. So uh, let me end it here quickly. Yeah, it's quite a, been a quite a long session. So thank you everybody for uh, for attending. Uh, there's another one coming up two weeks from now. So, um, uh, you know, uh, look out for your WhatsApp or your email. We will remind you. And uh, so till then, have a good weekend, everybody. Thank sorry, you. Danny, we have a post poll to just complete. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So, Ajinda, take it away. <laughs> so, there's a poll. So, uh, Ajinda, how do they access the poll? It has been shared in the chat. Ah, so, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, everybody, please, uh, um, uh, please go to the chat. There's a survey at the end for you guys to fill up. Um, uh, please do, please do help us. Uh, please cooperate and fill up those for us, please. Uh, this is a typical one of those things that uh, the funders will want. You know that you guys have uh, appreciated the thing. You learned something and what you think of all this kind of thing. So please take three minutes to uh, fill up the form. Is that right, Adip? Am I doing okay? Yes, yes you're doing fine. <laughs> so as, as Danny was saying, thank you very much for, for coming. And we greatly appreciate your attendance here. Um, if you could please fill up the, the post masterclass survey form, that would be of great help to us. Um, for the funders and also for, I think, our speakers as well, because I think they really want to know, kind of gauge the impact that this has all had on the audience and, uh, and how much they have learned. Um, I know I've, and it's uh, for future reference, it would be, and we have some people filling it up now. So as Danny was saying, um, the speakers are available. Um, you will be getting into more contact with them later, especially once you start commencing your story projects. So feel free to really uh, think and ruminate on some of the content. You can go back and watch the video um, in the meantime. Um, before we share the video with you, Personally, you can actually view the recording on Facebook Live, McKinney Academy's Facebook Live, but um, just have a moment to think about it and uh, contemplate whatever questions you have. Um, a note for the speakers, more questions started to come in just at the very tail end of, of, the, of the whole whole session. So I think people are taking time to digest a lot of this information because much of it's new. And as and the many of the issues that you raise, I think are things that most of us have never heard of before. Um, I think that um, most most of us can say can say that. So um, we'll just take a Danny. I think we'll we'll leave the call on just for um, a short while, just like for the remaining five minutes for people to fill in. Um, and uh, if our speakers had any comments or things last minute things they wanted to share um, about the about the masterclass or about what how they hope to interact with the participants if not that's fine and uh, anyway once once you've completed the form then uh, feel free to um, say goodbye in the chat and we'll see you in the in the next class
I guess what we discussed before is that it might be more convenient if uh, those who want to consult with us can um, we can do it as a group. So mm -hmm. I so we can just set a time uh, with the four of us. Uh, so yeah, once once the once the journalists get organized, um, we can go to that step, lah, Try to figure out a time that would be good for us to be able to take your questions and give some comments or feedback on the on the pieces that you are developing. Absolutely. Okay. All right, well, if um, we'll just give some people 